forward to more information in the next lecture. Uh, on my personal level, uh, there are some terms that need translation. Yesterday, I discussed uh, with Dr. Ahmed Jo, and he told me uh, that he will solve uh, this uh, during today's lecture. Dr. Ahmed, you hear me? Al uh, Jabbar, uh, yeah, I'm I'm hearing you very well. I discussed that with <laughs> with uh, architect Muhammad Abu Hamad, and they are going, I think, to uh, uh, to have a brief presentation about uh, such terminology to be uh, very clear to all. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Yes. Thank you. So sir. I think Muhammad Abu Hamad is going to solve this issue. Thank Inshallah. you, Jamal. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, 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 we're happy to see you again today. Um, and uh, quickly, just concerning the last comment raised by Jabir and Dr. Ahmed, we'll be ha having a five, minute, five minutes um, uh, presentation that explains some of the terminologies in Arabic. So that will facilitate uh, the understanding of uh, the rest of the training. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome again. It's nice to see you all uh, one more time, one more day in our long uh, sessions. Not so long, very exciting. Uh, I just want to start with a very short round of introduction for those who didn't have the, uh, the chance to introduce themselves yesterday. Uh, I know we have uh, a few. So um, if anyone who is uh, who's with us today that wasn't with us yesterday, please uh, raise your hand and uh, tell us a little bit more about you, uh, what you do, what your background is, and uh, um, uh, any experiences or uh, uh, perceptions uh, uh, you have on this training. Uh, Tamara. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tamara Hordali. Uh, I work at the CCHP at the research unit. Uh, I've previously worked on uh, World Heritage documents, uh, such as a nomination document for Kremizan Valley as an extension for Batir. And I've also worked on the uh, conservation management plan for Bethlehem. Uh, type to respond to uh, Jabber's request and also uh, to, to confirm uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed's uh, um, remark. Uh, we'll start with a very short presentation and uh, uh, sorry, dear Sarah and Askani will have this in Arabic. It will be a very, very short uh, presentation just to highlight the terms, um, mainly the outstanding universal value, integrity, authenticity, um, and uh, attributes. Um, it's only six slides, uh, so if you can just bear, bear with us uh, shortly. Uh, واضحة عند الكل؟ واضحة بس لنصمت الضوء على على فحوى المصطلحات الأساسية اللي عم عم نتناقش فيها بهذا التدريب 
احنا مبدئيا عم نحكي على اتفاقية التراث العالمي اللي صادرة ب 1970 اللي اللي بت بت بتسلط الضوء على التراث العالمي اللي مهم على على مستوى العالم. لتطبيق اتفاقية التراث العالمي في خطوط في مبادئ توجيهية تم إصدارها من قبل اليونسكو واللي بتعطينا الوسائل أو ال ال الادوات البسيطه لحتى ان يتم تنفيذ الاتفاقيه على المدى السهل، المبادئ التوجيهيه موجوده بالعربي واستخرجنا المصطلحات اللي عم اللي حنحكي عنها هلا من من الوثيقه نفسها، طبعا ممكن نشاركها معكم في حال اي حدا مهتم منكم. المصطلح الاول اللي مركزين عليه هو القيمه العالميه الاستثنائيه اللي إذا بنقرأ يمكن بيكون أحسن هي الدلالة الفائقة اللي بيتمتع فيها الموقع من ناحية ثقافية أو طبيعية واللي ممكن الأهمية هاي تتجاوز الحدود الوطنية يعني مش عم نحكي على موقع مهم للدولة فقط ممكن الأهمية تكون على المستوى الأكبر والأهمية هاي بتكون مشتركة للجيل اللي عاصر اللي المعاصر الموقع وللأجيال اللاحقة كمان وبالتالي بسبب الأهمية الفائقة لهذا الموقع الحماية بتكون قصوى للدولة والعالم بشكل عام المصطلح الثاني اللي حكينا عنه هو الانتجريتي أو السلامة اللي بصورة أو بأخرى لازم تكون متوفرة لحتى نحافظ على سلامة على حماية الموقع واللي بشكل عام بتحكي عن اكتمال العناصر الضروريه لحتى تعبر عن القيمه العالميه للموقع وكمان يكون كل شيء مترابط بصوره او باخرى. العنصر الثالث اللي هو الاصاله او الاوثنتسيتي واللي بيصب بيسلط الضوء على ال مصداقية المعلومات الموجودة اللي بتعرف الموقع وكمان يعني 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 الأصالة بالذات هي بتتحدث عن مصداقية المعلومات اللي في نفس الموقع قديش تعبر عن حقبة تاريخية معينة سواء كانت عناصر فيزيائيه او غيرها بتعبر عن الموقع ودلالاته عبر الزمن، هذه بنستخدم احنا مصطلح الاصيل اللي هو يعني الاصلي الاصلي الراجع للمنشا، فاذا اذا استمرت معنا عبر الاجيال العناصر المختلفه للموقع بنفس الطريقه اللي وجدت فيها اصلا هنا بتكتمل جوانب الاصاله. طيب اخر شيء عندنا او مش اخر شيء عندنا الفيزيكال اتريبيوتس واللي هي كان كان امبارح عم ينحكى عنها بالامثله اللي انطرحت هي الـ الـ السمات او الخصائص الموجوده بالممتلك نفسه او بالموقع نفسه اللي لازم تكون يعني هي جزء هي جزء اساسي من الموقع وبالتالي حمايتها والحفاظ عليها بيؤدي الى حفاظ حفاظ الحفاظ وحمايه الممتلك بشكل عام من من الامثله على الاتريبيوتس او او الخصائص الفيزيائيه للموقع ممكن تكون الشكل، ممكن تكون الماده، ممكن تكون الاستعمال او الوظيفه، ممكن تكون التقاليد او الممارسات اللي بتم تنفيذها بهذا المكان، المكان نفسه ومحيطه، ممكن يكون الاشكال المختلفه من من انواع التراث غير المادي اللي موجوده في في المكان نفسه الروح اللي بتعطي بعطي المكان وممكن تكون عوامل ثانيه داخليه او خارجيه بتعتمد على كل على كل مكان وعلى طبيعه هذا المكان. بالتالي الحمايه والاداره لا الا للسمات الفيزيائيه هاي هي الاساس لحتى نحافظ على موقع التراث على موقع التراث العالمي. من من خلال مصطلح السلامه ومصطلح الاصاله والخصائص الفيزيائيه اللي بتم اللي بتنبثق من الموقع نفسه بيتم صياغه مخطط الحمايه والاداره لكل موقع بحيث يتم حمايه والحفاظ على كل واحد من الخصائص الفيزيائيه، طبعا كل دوله بتحط النظام المعين تبعها لحتى تحمي الخصائص الفيزيائيه الخاصه بكل مكان. ما بعرف اذا حدا عنده اي سؤال. فقط للتلخيص سلام الجميع يعني اتفاقية التراث العالمي 
بشكل اساسي تتحدث عن القيمه العالميه الاستثنائيه للموقع هذه قضيه الاو يو في اللي هي المركز اللي بيدور حوله بتدور حول الاتفاقيه والاتفاق والقيمه العالميه الاستثنائيه هي تمثل يعني زي ما حكت زميلتي سناء قيمه تتجاوز حدود المحليه تتجاوز الحدود الاقليميه وتصبح مهمه للبشريه ما يمكن ان يعبر عن هذه القيمه من خصائص مختلفه هي السمات الفيزيائيه وما يثبت هذه القيمه من ناحيه سلامه الموقع ومن ناحيه اصالته هو هو ما هو مطلوب يعني الاصاله والسلامه او شروط الاصاله والسلامه هي شروط لاثبات وجود القيمه العالميه الاستثنائيه للموقع او للاصل والحفاظ عليها عليها جميعا فيما بعد هي وظيفه الاداره والحفاظ الفعال يعني بالملخص محمد تسمح لي اضيف بس شغله كمان تفضل يعني صباح الخير لكم جميعا اولا ويعطيكم العافيه ونتمنى يعني اليوم نستكمل مع بعض يعني انا يعني شكرا سلام شكرا محمد يعني الامور كثير كثير واضحه بس يعني انا بجوز يعني دائما الترجمه حتى ترجمه الاوبريشن جايد لاينز للعربي يعني لحتى الان بجوز فيش اتفاق حتى على المصطلحات العربي يعني بس على على كل يعني انا بدي هيك ابسط الامور بال خليني احكي باللهجه الفلسطينيه اكثر اللي نكون فاهمين على بعض اكثر فيها يعني زي ما حكى محمد وسلام يعني احنا بنحكي عن القيم العالميه الاستثنائيه اللي هي الاو يو في بشكل اساسي وبنحكي كمان عن لما حكينا امبارح عن الاذر فاليوز كمان اللي هي الاذر فاليوز اللي بتتعلق بالقيم الوطنيه القيم المحليه هاي القيم يعني كمان هي مهمه للموقع بالاضافه لقيم العالميه الاستثنائيه يعني بالشرط احنا نحكي انه والله بس في عندنا قيم قيم عالميه استثنائيه وبدنا نحافظ عليها لا كمان القيم الثانيه مهمه وهذا يعني هاي القيم نفسها احنا ما بدنا نحكي عن موقع تراث عالمي او مسجل طبعا هي بتكون يعني زي تبرير او جاستيفيكيشن كمان للي احنا بنسميه المعايير يعني هناك يعني في عندنا 10 معايير احنا المفروض اي موقع سواء ثقافي او طبيعي ينطبق عليه اقل شيء معيار واحد علشان يتسجل على قائمه التراث العالمي علشان هيك يعني اهم يعني اهم شيء في في اي ملف تراث عالمي او اي موقع تراث عالمي ان نحافظ على هاي القيم وخاصه القيم العالميه الاستثنائيه سواء من طبعا من ناحيه اصاله من ناحيه سلامي والى اخره علشان هيك يعني احنا يعني اي مس خلينا احكي بالقيم العالميه الاستثنائيه لهذا الموقع لاي موقع فبالتالي بقلل من قيمته ممكن يؤدي فيما بعد الى شطبه او حذفه من قائمه التراث العالمي اذا احنا ما حافظناش عليه علشان هيك احنا هاي الدوره اللي هي الامباكت اسسمنت بالتحديد اللي هي تقييم الاثر لها علاقه كيف اذا احنا عندنا اي مشروع بده ينفذ سواء احكي في في الممتلك التراث العالمي اللي هو الكور زون او في البفر زون اللي هي المنطقه العازله او المنطقه الحمايه بالاساس لا لممتلك التراث التراث العالمي بحيث انه احنا قبل تنفيذه وهذا برجع كنا في مرحله التخطيط يعني قبل التنفيذ يعني يعني ما بزبط انه احنا لما نيجي ننفذ نحكي والله بدنا نعمل هذا التقييم لا هو في مرحله التخطيط المفروض يتم عمل هذا هذا الشيء علشان احنا كمان نضمن انه اي مشروع ما بيأثر على القيم العالمية الاستثنائية وفي نفس الوقت يعني طبعا أنا مش حكي كثير دخلت خلصت إنه لأنه في عندنا كمان إحنا مجتمع محلي كمان مجتمع محلي كثير كثير مهم فبالتالي يعني هو بده يكون في عندنا توازن ما بين الحفاظ على قيم الموقع سواء القيم العالمية الاستثنائية أو القيم الأخرى بالإضافة لخدمة المجتمع المحلي وشكرا لكم وإذا في أي شيء غير واضح يعني حتى قبل ما نبدا يعني ارجو من المشاركين انه فعلا يثيروا قبل ما نبدا لانه احنا كل ال... يعني هذا التدريب هو بيعتمد على هاي الامور فالمفروض تكون كثير واضحه شكرا لكم وانا متاسف طولت يعني شكرا شكرا دكتور احمد انا شوف اف اني ون هاز اني كويستشنز بيفور وي جيف ذا فلور تو ساره Okay, uh, dear Sara, please, uh, it's yours. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, well, thank you for the people who asked for those clarifications and thank you to <laughs> colleagues there, Ramallah, for providing more information. We are aware that you are all coming with very different experience. Some of you are very familiar with all of these, um, with World Heritage. Some of you are very familiar with impact assessment. Some of you have experience in other areas. So please do keep uh, asking questions when we are not clear. And we can um, hopefully by the end of the week, we all reach a, a shared level of understanding of all these issues. Um, I, I do point out that we also have in this Zoom, the chat, where if sometimes the, the, um, the explanation isn't clear, you can always ask for a question um, and we can make sure that we clarify everything for you. Um, I don't need to talk very long now because we want to start work, but just to, um, ex to remind us what we did yesterday, also for the new people. So yesterday, our idea was to give you an overview of the entire impact assessment. So we looked at why we would do it, with the, the idea that you can use an impact assessment in many, uh, in many different um, contexts when we need to understand what change might happen at a World Heritage property. And we uh, explained the theory of the many steps that you can take to introduce this methodology and gave some case studies. Now, from today and for the rest of the course, we will go in more detail in the individual steps and the idea is that we speak in more detail, but then you will work in groups in order to do some exercises and become familiar with the work. Now, I wanted to warn you of one thing. I'm going to... We have... Um, I don't know if everybody has seen this document. Can I just ask, have we given the link already to the shared folder? Yes, I think it okay. is there. I think everyone okay. uh, has access to the uh, to the shared folder. Please, uh, if you do not have. No, I didn't receive any link. Okay. Well, to today you will, you will receive oh. <laughs> you yeah. will receive a link. Oh, um, and we yesterday she gave it. I don't know. Okay, we'll we'll manage to do that uh, quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We've, we've created a folder that will uh, help us throughout the rest of the course. The idea is that each day when we have given the presentations, we're putting them in this folder. So already there is available the presentations we gave yesterday. And then there is information on the work that you will be doing this week. Um, this was a, a very uh, general overview of the exercises we will carry out each day. I just, in this moment, want to bring your attention to one thing, which is that on the final day of the course, you will have worked in groups for the entire course, and each group on the last day will give a presentation of their thoughts and their uh, results. So please pay attention when we're, when we're doing the next exercises, because uh, it, will all, it will all be very important on the last day. And we will we are essentially asking you to spend these days thinking about uh, a case study example. We're going to have a presentation very shortly about Bethlehem and the World Heritage property there. And then we will be looking at a project that was proposed there once and tr trying to um, really understand this particular case as, an, an, as a real life example. And on the final day, you'll be giving a presentation now, you don't need to worry too much about this now. We will explain in more detail. But I wanted to give you this in a, as an incentive to listen very carefully <laughs> throughout the rest of the, uh, the work that we're doing today and the following days. With each exercise, we will explain the details, but know that they it's a little bit like a puzzle. Each element, each exercise will come together for that final day of presentation. OK, so that's your motive to listen. Um, the only thing that I really wanted to just add now is that I know that yesterday there were some concerns that this seems like a complicated methodology. My hope is that each, as you do each task, you will begin to understand that it's not so complicated if you take one piece at a time. I think what is complicated is our world 
and our heritage and society and its relationship with the heritage. That's what's complicated. And that's what is making decision making so very difficult for our governments. But if we use a clear methodology, we can then present our recommendations to uh, the authorities making decisions and we can present those recommendations very clearly. So hopefully from the, the complexity and the confusion, we end up at the end of the week with some clear ideas. So that's our hope. Um, I don't want to respond now, but maybe Ascania wants to, but I, I have changed my PowerPoints this morning to respond to the questions from yesterday. So I'm not going to address them immediately now, but when we do the presentations later, hopefully the discussions that we started yesterday, we will continue today. So from my point of view, that is all I wanted to say now. Ascania, did you have anything extra? So in that case, we would be very happy to pass over to our uh, case study presentation and really start the hard work of the course. Yeah, it's your turn, Shaima. Good morning, everyone. Do you hear me? Good morning. Uh, I'm glad to share with you presentation about uh, the World Heritage of Property, the birthplace of Jesus, the Church of the Nativity, and pilgrimage route. Okay. You know, this World Heritage Property was inscribed on the World Heritage List, immediately on the World Heritage List in danger as emergency nomination in according with the criteria four and six. Because it's suffered from the lack of proper maintenance and repair because of political situation in area and region since 1967 and uh, the lack of free movement during the Israeli occupation, unfortunately. In particular, serious rainwater ingress that had led to decay of the roof, chambers, and other historic fabric, including the walls, mosaic, and column frescoes. After three years, in 2015, the World Heritage Committee adopted the desired state conservation for the removal of property as follows, to remove the property from the danger list, complete conservation and repair of the roof structure of the Church of the Holy Nativity. Corrective measures include complete a full investigative survey of historic timbers and lead work of the roof, identifying the age of the age significance of the various component part develop conservation plan that synthesis conclusion of the details investigative survey into a clear statement of the significances of the various elements of the roof within a comprehensive conservation philosophy for the roof restoration project prepare a detailed project's specification for the roof repairs that allow a full understanding of which element of the roof will be maintained, repaired, and replaced. Undertake the roof repair project, include, including stabilizing the vaults of the Nordics and document its interventions. You know, conservation management plan for the World Heritage Property finalized and adopted approved by all related parties in 2019 and now implemented this plan according, uh, according to uh, all the partners and prepared with the, uh, the plan prepared with the cooperation of CCHP, Bethlehem Municipality and the Presidential Committee for Restoration uh, with the general fundraising of, by uh, World Heritage Fund and this plan will be uploaded, uploaded soon on the World Heritage web page, uh, maybe today or tomorrow. You know, this is the happy moment of uh, when the World Heritage Committee adopted the decision to remove the property from the list of World Heritage in danger due to achievement the desired state of conservation and the corrective measures set. It was in PACO last year in 2019. I want to show us now the video. Okay. Here. 
Okay. This video show us some, do you hear the voice? Okay. This video show us some of restoration that conducted in the church of the nativity before the decision was adopted to achieve desired state of conservation for the removal of the property from the list of world heritage in danger and corrective measures. This is the roof before restoration. Okay. We cannot hear the voice of the video. Probably you can uh, uh, fix that. We just only hear your voice. We are very glad to complete this restoration. Shaima, since this is on YouTube, maybe you can share the link with us um, in the chat box. Okay. Uh, excuse me, could you repeat? I don't hear you. We don't hear the sounds, uh, uh, Shaima. So maybe you can share the link uh, on the, for the okay. YouTube in the chat box so that uh, everybody can have access to it later on. Okay, let's move to talk about the project suggested into the World Heritage Property and its buffer, Bethlehem Passageway and Commercial Village. You know, Bethlehem Passageway, as we see in figure and shown in sketch, according to response to Bethlehem Development Foundation, PDF, need for the development of shallow passageway in the city of Bethlehem, provided design ideas for shallow passageway of around 168 meter is proposed to allow an easier traffic flow and more convenient access to the area by locals, pilgrims and tourists. This short shallow passageway underlies the road segment between the Peace Center and Armenian Patriot car parking lot at uh, Lion Street, as we see in figure, Part of Manager Street was lowered at the intersection of Passageway. Two covered sections provided a long passageway between the Nativity Church and Manager Square and at Melke Grotto Street crossing. One proposed with train bridge at the shown bridge taking into account the limited available space. The second project, Commercial Village, suggested also as we show in sketch above, Milky Grotto Street separate the city center project and the Church of the Nativity. This design was aimed to wide the street by two meters from four meter to six meter. Moreover, the area adjacent to the street designed as an open space as shown in the sketch, as shown in the sketch above. This high, the highest point of the project is designed to be 10 meter, which is lower than the adjacent Armenian convenient of um, the Nativity Church, which is 11.79 uh, meters, which means that's lower than uh, the Nativity Church uh, by 1.79 centimeter. These several, or these two projects, expressed between their proposed and their cancellation several years in order to review and request the necessary justification and independent heritage impact assessment and submit these to World Heritage Center for review by the advisory bodies. In line with the requirement of paragraph 172 of the operational guidelines before any irreversible. The first year was in 2015, the state party submitted to the World Heritage the concept proposal for the Manager Square Tunnel and Manager Square Village in 2016, uh, noted with concern and requested the necessary justification and, and uh, uh, sorry. The World Heritage Committee expressed its concern about the two uh, proposed projects, requested the necessary justification and independent heritage impact assessment in line requirement of paragraph 
172 of the operational guidelines before their implementation. In 2017, the Manager Square Tunnel project has been postponed and the Manager Square uh, uh, Tunnel project has been canceled. In 2018, also notes that the Manager Square Tunnel project has been canceled based on the guidelines decision of the World Heritage Committee and recommendation of a commerce advisory body, noting that two projects were an obstacle to remove the site from the danger list before the decision. So the desired state of conservation for removal of the property from the list of danger has been achieved after canceling these two projects and complete restoration and achieving corrective measures. Then the decision has been adopted last year in 2019 to remove a birth place, Jesus, a birth place of Jesus Church of the Nativity and Pilgrim Crew. This is the decision 43 adopted in Paco on 2019. Thank you all. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Shaima. Um, uh, I just wanted to highlight that the, the two pro uh, proposed projects uh, will be discussed thoroughly next week. Uh, what, Fine. what we... Sorry? Fine. Okay. I hear you. Okay. You can stop sharing your screen. Uh, we will just discuss these two projects next week, but uh, what we wanted to highlight more this uh, on this session is the... Uh, uh, other component of the site in Bethlehem, that is the pilgrimage route. And also we wanted to emphasize more on the uh, OUV of the site in Bethlehem and also the attributes uh, of the site. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about those two aspects? You know, also we are working uh, now on uh, beautification on the Star Street and we mentioned on uh, the SOC report and uh, we will also uh, talking more in, during uh, this uh, session about it. Uh, okay, um, maybe I can explain a little bit more. Um, the site in Bethlehem uh, is composed of two components. We have the uh, pilgrimage route that is historically believed to be the route taken by Joseph and Mary from their uh, uh, way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Nazareth to Bethlehem uh, 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 at the time when Jesus was born. And uh, it is marked by uh, facades of historic buildings. Uh, it is almost 700 meters long. And uh, it starts at a certain point and leads towards the Church of the Nativity. Uh, the site in general is uh, known for being the, per the birthplace of Jesus, which is uh, the founder of Christianity and the founder of a religion that is uh, uh, widespread all over the world. Um, historically speaking, the site has, has witnessed uh, several developments and uh, also st stand to, uh, stands witness to uh, uh, certain eras and uh, uh, specific points that, that shape the, the, uh, the history, more or less. Uh, and also socially, the site has a, a very uh, unique value uh, in terms of the traditions and practice, practices that are uh, implemented on the ground, mainly during Christmas season. Uh, the site has, uh, uh, in, addition to, in addition to history and religion it, uh, and social values, it has uh, um, um, more um, uh, intangible uh, um, um, uh, values and practices that are uh, that affect more or less the, the uh, inhabitants of the city. Uh, in, uh, in addition to an, uh, an enormous economic value that is attributed to the uh, high wave of tourism that takes place every uh, year in, in, uh, in Palestine in general. Uh, those values are, are uh, uh, attributed to the, the uh, are linked to the attributes that uh, are defined for the, for the site. Um, we speak about uh, um, thousands of historic buildings uh, that are located in the, inside the buffer zone and outside the buffer zone. Hence, we have uh, the, the architectural uh, value, uh, the architectural attribute, the religious attribute. In, in addition to the Church of the Nativity, we have a huge number of churches that uh, attract a, 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 a very um, a huge number also of tourists that uh, not also visit the Church of the Nativity, but, uh, but also the, uh, uh, the, other, uh, the churches of, of other denominations. Um, uh, another attribute that uh, was emphasized uh, in, the, uh, in the nomination dossier was uh, uh, 
um, the, the historical, uh, add to that the social, the, the economic, and based on that, um, we have those little segments that have to be protected in, in order to maintain the, uh, OU, the general OUB of the site. Um, speaking of the soft, the soft report, uh, Shaima, I, I don't know what you want to, to add to that as well. If, uh, if, if you if you allow me, yeah, yeah. If you allow me, Hello? Salam. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Salam. Thank you, uh, Shaima. Uh, actually, I'm not going to add uh, too much to to this uh, point, uh, but uh, as a case study will will be taken for. Uh, uh, the impact assessment, I think it's very important to share, you know, all the participants uh, with the management and conservation plan in addition uh, to the, let's say, uh, might be, I, I don't think it's um, important, might be for the nomination file, <laughs> but the uh, state, the statement of, cons uh, of outstanding universal value, I think it's, it's important as well to, to be shared. So, uh, because they are going to to work on the on the in the OUV in addition to the uh, uh, physical attributes. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, if if you would like, we can present you know the uh, the statement of outstanding universal value. Okay, in uh, in addition to the uh, physical attributes. Okay, to be uh, uh, understood for all. Uh, all participants, but I, I think it's more important uh, to participate the management and conservation plan because uh, it includes uh, analysis of the OUV and other values and the physical attributes, which is I think more important for this uh, for this training. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh... Are there any questions or remarks from uh, our facilitators or the uh, uh, participants? Sarah? Uh, no, I just I just wanted to first of all thank you for the for the presentation. I think because this is a, a case study that we will be using across the course now. We've already started to share information and the, the idea of sharing the management plan is also um, would be very useful. Um, but I don't think we, we need to worry too much about um, reading everything immediately or presenting everything immediately because you might get all the answers. <laughs> and if the management plan has, has had a lot of work behind it. And if you all go to read it immediately, some of the exercises you will find too easy. So um, we will we will take it one step at a time. So for today, I think that was um, a, a nice introduction. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, well, I think it, now it's, uh, 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 you'll, take, you'll be leaving the floor now uh, for the uh, uh, people-centered centered approaches to heritage management. It's, uh, okay. Okay, Salam, but uh, uh, allow me for this. I think it's uh, important, might be at least to share uh, the SOUV of Bethlehem. This is, this, is, uh, this is important, you know, for, for all participants. No, absolutely, I, I do agree. We have got an exercise uh, later this morning that is on the, uh, the OUV and the values of Bethlehem. So it will be something that we're looking at. So there is, um, everyone will get a very good uh, detailed understanding of the property. I think that's not a problem. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Sarah, please. Well, uh, yes. So you've now understood that you will also have work to do and it's not just uh, us speaking to you, <laughs> but I assume we will be sharing the work with you. Um, so I come to the first of our presentations, which is a bit more detailed about different elements of impact assessment. And if you remember yesterday, we started talking about participation as the first step. So I've got a quick presentation, which, uh, which looks at that, how we can involve people. So I shall share my screen. Um, because if you re recall, this is something that we need to look at 
people, which people, who is involved at every step of the impact assessment, which stakeholders are involved, who needs to be involved in different ways, is, um, is something that we need to consider throughout the whole process. And I, I just think it's worth noticing that in impact assessment, the, the best practice for impact assessment is that uh, it's transparent. This doesn't always happen, but when you look at the people who do environmental impact assessment and other forms internationally at the highest standards, this is not an option. You can't decide to involve people or not involve people. It is necessary. And all the uh, international standards repeat this message. So I think it's worth not considering it. That's why we've always put it at the first of our process. It is not an option. This is something to consider throughout. Um, and indeed, it's not just an issue for impact assessment. I think you will begin to understand across this course that um, good impact assessment is in fact connected to good management in general. And that means that the big overarching themes of world heritage apply to all impact assessments. Now I've taken these two extracts from the operational guidelines, which you are now all very familiar with also in Arabic. <laughs> so you can go and uh, read the translation too you'll see that we're talking about participation as part of world heritage, all of the processes, not just uh, impact assessment. And this emphasis has been placed on communities and involving them uh, by the committee itself. In 2007, communities became a strategic objective. In 2012, there were the 40 year uh, celebrations and the theme was this one that you can see on the screen sustainable development and local communities and it's in this context that um, ICROM as an advisory body launched a program on people-centered approaches to the conservation of heritage and this was uh, started with an expert meeting continued with some research and it resulted in the guidance document that you can see on this slide so just for the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you the conclusions that came out of that programme, because they're not just relevant uh, to all world heritage, they're also relevant to impact assessment here. So it's important to begin uh, with some very clear statements that heritage is not an abstract, isolated concept, despite the fact that it is often represented, you know, you often get logos which are a single monument that seems to be very clean and empty and in isolation. Instead, heritage is actually part of our culture and that means it's been created by people and for people. In fact, scientists are now discovering quite how fundamental culture is to us as a species. Uh, it has literally shaped how human beings have evolved and how our brains function. And that should make us reflect on the centrality of culture to people and the importance indeed of our work in protecting it, but also the importance of not uh, divorcing it from the people who have helped to create it. But while we could talk about individual people in, um, and their contribution to heritage, it's actually useful to think in terms of groups of people. In, when we're doing our work. And that's why there is inevitably talk about the word communities. Um, I think it's useful to, to understand that there are many types of communities. Often when we use the word local community, we're actually talking about communities of place, those who live in or near to the heritage. But equally, we can recognize communities of interest. So people who have another connection to the heritage. In our case study, there is a religious community that extends around the world. They're not the local community, but they certainly feel a strong connection to Bethlehem. And we have those of us who work with the heritage. There's all many different groups of people who would want to uh, know about and be involved in our heritage. And these days, it's recognised that there's rarely a case where a single piece of heritage can be successfully managed by a single uh, heritage authority. Our world, unfortunately, and our heritage is much more complex than that. 
and there are many groups involved, even if in the past they weren't always recognised, they have always been there. Now, this recognition of complexity has required a re-evaluation of how the heritage sector works. For a long time, and indeed it still happens in some places, there has been an approach to conservation which places the expert in a position to decide everything. And over time, this um, it's been recognised that we can't just focus on the materials that the expert usually studies. Uh, the fabric of a building, it's not enough. And um, we've started to, to take values-based approaches, trying to understand why a place is important. It's not because it's made of bricks or made of stone. It usually has values and meanings that go beyond that. And once you start asking why somewhere is important, you end up having to think, who is it important for? And you start listening to more people. Interestingly, World Heritage, with its focus on outstanding universal value, is part of this values-based approach, or it should be. But you will note that we've still got an expert at the center. And even if they listen to all the stakeholders around them, they essentially continue to have decision-making power. So over the last decade or so, there has been a push to more people-centered approaches where the various stakeholders are all equal parts of the discussion and equal parts of, its, of the conservation of heritage. Now, at heritage places that are considered living, this is actually, uh, this has been quite easy. It's been clear that community engagement often brings advantages to both the heritage and to the community. And that's because communities contain capacities and assets that can outlast our political structures and outlast our professional organizations even. And they complement specialist knowledge that we might have in our sector with long-term traditional knowledge that has kept these heritage places protected for centuries. Now, people-centered approaches can actually use those capacities to offer, continue to offer long-term conservation. And um, that usually, it's been shown, brings huge benefits to the heritage, a continuity and a resilience that we can't match. But before you think that it's all very nice to have living heritage in places like Asia, um, it's becoming increasingly evident that the the definition of living heritage can also apply to places that seem very modern, but the definition of somewhere that continues to be used with the same function by the same community and is conserved, it can even apply to uh, London, where I come from. So there's been, um, all the work on living heritage has uh, essentially come up with some very key points that I think you'll agree are useful in, in any context, not just those places that we, we consider living, but that all heritage actually plays a living role in our world today. We need to remember the intangible. A building is not uh, as important if we don't continue to use it, it becomes empty. We know that cultural heritage is part of life. It was created to be used. And so we need to understand its living aspects even today, even something like an archeological site, which used to be defined as dead heritage, which is a dreadful term. They have, uh, they have a meaning today in society. It might be a changed function. Things might have evolved over time, but there is a relevance to contemporary life. And we need to understand the community's connections and see where they are capable of engaging in their care for those heritage places, because they have and they will outlast whichever heritage authority we are working in. So I've, I've kind of given the positive version, but the research has also shown that the negative version, where we put a fence around a monument and divorce it from society, this imbalance where the heritage authorities take over too much often leads to uh, big problems for the conservation. I'll give you when, one very brief example because we don't have too much time for this, but this is a view of a World Heritage property 
from the perspective of some local residents. You would not guess where you are. This happens in all too many places. We're actually, if you see the red circle, that's the wall. It's right next to the Roman town of Herculaneum, which is part of the World Heritage property with Pompeii. The local residents simply, uh, for all too long, were cut off totally. This is what they can't see, but they live uh, only a few meters away and they're not uh, allowed you know, access. This is something that's changing. This is a, a place that Nascani and I have worked at for many years. Things are changing over time. But if you look historically at the problems that were there in Herculaneum, when the community was cut off from its heritage, it was a parallel to a total crisis of conservation. And it became an international scandal about a Roman city that was literally falling down. And it, uh, these factors are very interlinked. Ah, here's the falling down <laughs> disaster um, when the conservation project worked. So we need to remember that taking people-centered approaches is not just a suggestion for something we might do when we have time. It should actually be a core component of our management and each process within our management system. We should be talking about um, strengthening the community's ability to participate meaningfully. It's not enough to have just a visit occasionally. There has to be a meaningful connection. If we manage to do it, there are huge advantages to the community and to society as a whole. But we also find that actually the research shows you get better managed, even if you're uninterested in working with communities. If it makes your job easier, you might find that you're inspired suddenly. But we do have, uh, there are some people who've come back, some specialists who perhaps don't agree with this point of view, who say there are lots of world heritage places where there are lots of people. Look, they're full, they're always full of uh, people. And it needs to be remembered that world heritage, which is full of people, are very often not people who are connected to that world heritage. We're often talking about tourism and it needs to be measured in terms of local residents. Do they still enjoy their heritage? Do they still have benefits from it? Do they still have a living connection? We need to get better at looking at heritage. It's not about counting visitor numbers and counting ticket sales. It should be something more meaningful. So we return once again to a theme you will continue to see throughout our course, sustainable development. Can we also think about creating sustainable communities in this context? And if we're, um, if we're wanting to measure things in economic, environmental and social benefits for, for our communities, we might also remember that by placing emphasis on conservation in this context, we're making sure that future generations can also enjoy the heritage. The sustainability works in many directions. So let's be quite concrete about what some of these benefits could be. Again, we often say the benefits for our communities is tourism. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's such an, uh, a theme which comes back over and over again, that the way that we allow our communities to um, take benefits to, to be involved in their heritage and to get benefits from it is only tourism. Fortunately, there's a lot of work now that is showing a great deal of more uh, sophisticated understanding of those relationships and the benefits that the communities of place can get, our local communities. Other communities of interest can find their own ways of working um, with the heritage which is more beneficial to all. And we should note that these benefits will vary from community to community, but hopefully we as communities of practice, those of us in this course, you might find benefits yourselves and benefits for the places that you're trying desperately to protect. Now, you might not necessarily agree with me, but here's someone much more important than me <laughs> who does agree with me, <laughs> or rather to be more modest, uh, I would agree with this statement. Um, it is recognized at the highest levels now that the heritage sector, unfortunately, does not have the resources to protect all of the heritage that we have identified. It is not possible 
for us to keep going with management systems in the conventional version where the specialists try desperately to do everything. It's proving in all around the world that it's not possible. We actually have a great deal of need of our local communities and our communities of interest in order to support our work. So that's um, very much uh, the, the final slide of my presentation. It has been, uh, I've tried to be incredibly quick because our program is so tight. You'll, you'll note that, that um, ICRAM does a course on this subject, which takes us two weeks. And I've, tr I've tried to stick to my allotted time of sort of 15 minutes today. So there's a lot more that we could discuss. I think many of you will have different opinions on this subject. Um, but returning to impact assessment, we are going to, as part of the course, try to see how this approach can be applied. Um, we're going to have a question time now, but I think uh, in the next exercise, we're actually going to want to link quite concretely how these grand ideas can be actually put into practice on the ground. But it's you guys that will be providing those solutions. So uh, that will be your, your one of your first tasks. But before we talk about um, your group work, is there anybody who would like to ask some questions now? If I may, Sarah, just one, one thing. Well, this is, um, uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, actually, my question uh, regarding the three communities, communities of place, of, of interest, and of practice. Um, I mean, you know that the, in, in every site, there is almost no um, uh, complete cohesion between the three communities, and there, is always, there are always clashes. And which one of them you think would be would rule at the end if if um, disputes concerning a topic uh, is raised? That's a very good question, <laughs> which I am scared to answer. <laughs> um, I think in a in an ideal world we would have people who are excellent mediators between. Uh, the groups and we would find happy solutions. I think if I was forced to choose, if we take a, a kind of long term perspective, for many of our heritage places, they have been cared for by the communities. They survive today because the local community was involved. We as a community of heritage people, we were a very recent arrival historically, and we we seem to have come and taken over and think that we know everything. But before we existed as a discipline, these places survived and for literally centuries. And I think sometimes we have to recognize that the community didn't do so badly before us, but that we do have, I don't think we need to be scared that we don't have something to offer um, because obviously most of us have dedicated our lives to studying things, to understanding how to do things in the hope of contributing. So I'm not saying that we don't have a role to play, but I think sometimes we are, as a sector can be very defensive and we could recognize those centuries long tradition of communities caring for place incredibly well. Um, and most of the problems where it stops being cared for, not everywhere, but in most places, it's when the modern world comes and intervenes with that healthy relationship and cuts them off. So I'd probably vote for the local community, but in its healthiest version before anybody gives me some nightmare scenario where my, my, my opinion is not valid. <laughs> I, I can see there was one question in the, in the chat about providing the slides. Um, we, we, we've been doing it, we did it for yesterday. I can, we can of course share these slides too. Um, you can have all the material and the relevant links. That's not a problem. Just concerning this uh, last comment, uh, sharing the materials, we will do that soon. I mean, uh, every participant who received the invitation will receive an access to uh, a shared um, uh, link. 
where all the materials has been, uh, which were uh, delivered yesterday are already there. And of course, all the materials of that training will be available until the end of the training. So just bear with us, uh, technically a uh, little bit of uh, probably difficulties, but uh, it will reach you. Thank you. Yeah, we're not hiding anything. You can have everything. You even have the recordings on Facebook, so you, <laughs> you can relive the experience over and over again. <laughs> Are there any more questions? You're all uh, overwhelmed and thinking big thoughts about communities. If, if there is nothing urgent and you're still digesting your thoughts for discussion later, then perhaps I could introduce the first exercise that we're going to do together. Is that okay? We, um, we are going to divide you into groups. So there will be four groups. So you're not alone. You've got friends to work with. <laughs> and thanks to the magic of Zoom, you will be put into individual rooms together to work on the exercise. Um, we, can, we will leave you alone to work uh, in high-speed Arabic, but if you want our assistance, we can come and talk to you and you will simply tell us. We will. We will all have the chat facility to be able to, you know, ask for assistance or to ask questions or clarifications. So that's in general for each of the exercises that we're doing. Specifically, the first task that we're going to ask you to do is to start thinking about the stakeholders. Now we've told you that we're going to be using um, Bethlehem, the Church of the Nativity and the pilgrimage route as our case study throughout. So we're going to ask you specifically to look at that I have got, I'm just uh, going to share with you another slide. If you, sorry, have a little bit of patience, please. And I am going to share my screen again with you. So I want to make sure everyone's clear what we're going to ask you to do. Here we are. Yes, okay. So this is our first task today. We are over the course of the uh, over the course of the course. Apologies for the <laughs> the bad English you are suffering with this week. Uh, at the end of the course, your presentation we are hoping will be in the form of a scoping study. Now you will remember from yesterday that the scoping study is where is the first step where you simply identify the big issues that will need to be addressed in the impact assessment. So you will not be looking at the entire impact assessment in, in six days, you will be glad to know, but just this first step where you identify what are the key things that need to be looked at. So in that context, one of the things that you will want to think about is who should be involved in the impact assessment. You're defining what was going to happen. And the stakeholders is obviously a very important point. So we're going to ask you two things. We're going to give you a template, which is in the shared drive, but we can also share it uh, as a file here. And I can show you that. There are many different ways of listing stakeholders. You might have ways of doing it that you prefer to do. I offer this template as a suggestion. Um, in my experience in doing work, it is not very useful to simply have a long list of people and groups that doesn't achieve much. It's just a list. It is much easier if you manage to analyze them. So I would suggest that together in your group, you start to think about who would be the stakeholders in Bethlehem. You may not know it uh, particularly well yourself, but someone in each group will. And you can always, uh, given this is an exercise, you can always suggest general terms like the local uh, business people. You don't necessarily need to need, know the name of everybody, but you would usefully start discussing in a group in which category you would place your stakeholder groups, yeah, in all the different There's types of communities. We didn't hear you. You can't, I've got somebody saying they can't hear, is that oh, true? Yes. Uh, the last, um, maybe last sentence, I didn't okay. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to ask you in your groups, you will start to identify the different stakeholder groups in all types and place them into one of these categories. 
So you're beginning to think exactly how you would work with them. And then we've got this second question. How exactly do you think these people should be engaged? So at what point would you talk to them? How much information, how much participation would they be able to have? So this is the first task. It's fairly simple. You are, you've got 15 minutes, so it's not too long. Um, all of these exercises will be very quick. You might not uh, list everything in the world, but you will start to really identify the key issues by doing them. So what we need to do, I don't know if um, it's perhaps simple if I share the template file in the chat, or would you prefer to share the link to the shared folder? I can do it. Or you, uh... Yes, Sarah, I think the, easy way, the easiest way is to share here in the chat. Yeah. And we will start distributing people to their breakout rooms too. You'd like me to post the link in the chat where they can access everything? Yes, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yes, yes. just a moment. moment. So we've just shared the link to the folders. There you can go in and you have the information in general about all of the exercises, but you will also find the worksheets. The worksheets also available in the chat to download. If you go to the shared folder, you will also find that I provided some examples. If you find it difficult, not of the actual stakeholders, but I gave some examples of how uh, they are sometimes involved in impact assessment to give you some suggestions. Um, but obviously you can come up with whatever you prefer to do in your own groups. Uh, I'm not sure who is able to now take the participants into their breakout rooms. I think people can probably now, we can send them to the rooms and they can start to discuss. We need to do it. Can you please, you would like to do it or we, we will do it because you already have the list as well. No, no, you, you can do it. It's better. Yeah, yeah, you have it. It's not good. So as you slowly go to your rooms, can I just remind you, if you need to contact any of us, you can still use the chat and we can read it. And we, <laughs> we've, uh, if you have any confusion or any doubts, we can either reply in the chat or we can come to speak to you directly in your room. Uh, there's also one comment before we go to the breakout rooms. If anybody uh, finds himself uh, not in the list, uh, probably because also um, uh, people were uh, registered as observers, uh, please let us know if you would like to join any of the groups. Uh, otherwise, we, if you enjoy being an observer, it's of course your uh, choice. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, seems this will take uh, a few minutes. So if you uh, may continue saying something. Uh, 
irrelevant to the training, if you wish, or irrelevant as you wish. Okay, in that, in that case, I will explain that I have sent, uh, the for those who don't want to go to the folder, I've sent the files for this morning's exercise. Um, we will be doing another exercise later with um, a scanner. We'll be talking about values and attributes. So we'll get quicker at this. And you will start to, um, if you want to start looking at the material now, whilst we go to the groups, it might help you have a better idea. Well, there's also another thing we may uh, say, uh, uh, actually concerning the groups themselves. Uh, the way we divided the groups were um, based on uh, um, the uh, experience uh, in the site and experience in the uh, World Heritage Terminologies and Concepts. And uh, we have the four groups. Every group we uh, uh, would like to nominate uh, a leader. Uh, so the first group would be uh, led by uh, Dr. Ahmed Arjou. Um, and the second group would be led by Marwa, the third by Ziad, and the fourth by Zahra. All of them are very familiar with uh, uh, either uh, management terms, world heritage terms, uh, probably uh, uh, assessment terms, and uh, they all, all of them know the site very well in Bethlehem. Each group will have uh, one from Bethlehem and one who actually worked directly uh, with the Church of the Nativity, at least, and um, uh, it includes um, the distribution also uh, geographically, so you will find our colleagues from Gaza, one of them at least in each group, and uh, as well as uh, 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 employees from the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities and uh, other uh, institutions. So it will be a little bit uh, uh, diverse, yes, and I hope it will be as well useful. Uh, if, as I said, if anyone is not uh, finding himself in, in any of the groups, please let us know. And um, uh, I would say if you wish to continue discussion in Arabic uh, inside the groups, but uh, please uh, uh, watch the time because you will have to reflect that in English in the tables. Uh, so, uh, yes. We got the link to Oh, okay. Oh, Giovanni suggests that we we already read the names. So the first group, uh, led by Dr. Ahmad, would be composed of uh, Raif, uh, Inas, uh, Asma, uh, Manal, uh, Lara, uh, and Ahmad Hifnawi. Uh, the second group, led by Marwa, uh, uh, composes of uh, Mahmoud Balawi, uh, 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 Samia. Samia Zaid, uh, Murad Tamimi, uh, Mustafa Jibreen, uh, Tamara Hodali, and Dana Abbas. Uh, group number three, led by Ziyad, uh, composed of Nashwa, uh, Jihad Ghazal, uh, Tamara Ariqat, Shayma Rumi, uh, Nahid Qasrawi, and uh, Muhammad Mansour. Uh, while the fourth group, led by Zahra, uh, uh, composes of uh, Luma Qumsiya, uh, Nisma, uh, Nuha, uh, Muhammad Abid, uh, Hanna Atallah, and Jabir Rju. Uh, whoever didn't uh, listen or uh, hear his name, please let us know so as to add to add him or her into one of the groups. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, so, Muhammad, uh, in a minute you will be uh, splitting us in groups. Exactly. You will be going, you will be finding yourself in a separate uh, room with the group. Okay. With, you heard your name, Amman. And. We have one. Which room? We have one. Are they here? They are here. Yes, they are connected. Uh, Ihab, Ihab, uh, uh, can you hear us? You would like to join any of the groups? Dr. Wael as well. Okay, in any case, they, uh, they join as, as observers, so they uh, might not be uh, available now. Yeah. Uh, sorry, but uh, how can we reach our uh, room or our group? You will find yourself there in, in, in a few minutes, <laughs> a few seconds probably. Magic. <laughs> Thank you. Because Automatically. And you will see a timer in each room showing you how much time remained to leave the room. Uh, how much time they have to be left there in the room, uh, uh, Sarah? 15 minutes? 
we said 15 minutes, but if you're doing very quickly, maybe we come at 10, 10 minutes because I know we're, we're quite slow today. We're learning. Yes, uh, <laughs> let's make it 10 minutes. Let's make it 10. Sorry, Mohammed, you mean you will link us uh, in another group, in another meeting Zoom? No, don't leave. You, you stay there. You will find yourself automatically taken to another room. Okay, that's good. You do not do anything. Thank you. You just, uh, you will be asked, I think uh, you will be having a message saying that you will be leaving to room X, for example, and then you continue in that way, and then you will be called back automatically. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Disappearing. Yeah. I like this. <laughs> Since you are a co-host, you can join any of the rooms. You have the join button. So you can join any of the rooms and you can broadcast a message to all participants. Uh -huh. I think I'm going to go into some rooms and ask them if they're okay and annoy them in English. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, how, how to do it? The bottom there, sal uh, sale gruppi. Security. No, at the bottom, sale gruppi. Yeah, my Zoom is in Italian. Next to condividere lo schermo. Yeah. Okay, I'm going into room one. I don't have this button. I'm sorry, I, I can see the, the button for for entering the rooms. Can you see the breakout option? No, uh, just share screen, chat, but participant yes. and security. You have three dots uh, more to, to see more options, right? At the bottom. Uh, at the bottom. Yes, where you uh, open the chat, see the participants. Did you see it? No. I don't know if it's me. Can you share your screen? Yes, sure. Here you have the three dots. It should be on, at the, on the bottom, but now since I'm sharing the screen, it goes up. From here, you will have the breakout. Where you oh, can... I'm seeing your uh, inbox. You see what? The inbox. Your inbox. <laughs> okay. Now, Okay, let me close the notes. Can you see the uh, yes. options? Okay, from the three dots, you will have the breakout room option where you can see the list of the rooms. What about sharing your screen? No, <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm going to share my screen, okay? Okay, from here. Here. Uh, yes. Yes, the breakout rooms below. Okay, no. uh, go to options on the top, please. 
I'm sorry, yeah, I can't see. You mean here? Yes. Could I? I can't see the Zoom option. Yeah, me too. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, group, sure. group three say they have a problem because uh, I think they should have Ziad and he's not there and they're waiting for him. Uh, Ziad? Yes. Okay, I assign him again. He should accept. So he will be assigned. The okay. They, they, want, they wanted a, a leader. <laughs> I like yes. it. Did you, find you. Yes. Did you find the the join option? No, <laughs> really no. I, I share again my screen, okay? Okay, please. Yes. yes. This is my toolbar. Yes, I can see your screen, but not the Zoom. Uh, open Zoom uh, okay. view option. From, from, from here, I think. Oh, I, don't, I really don't know. Uh, Zoom application. Let yes, me... this is open. Just okay. starting this way. I request a control. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Bye. Using a web? No, no, the application. Okay. I would suggest leave the meeting and join again, and I will okay. assign the host again because it's. I will do it. Okay, I will do it. Yes, please. Uh, في حدا دخل على الاجتماع هلا uh, ب والاسم اللي مباين ايفون مين معنا؟ Yes, here I am. Do you want to take the control? 
You still cannot see the breakout options? No, I just see the house has opened a breakout room. Please wait to be assigned. Uh, okay, please share the screen. Yeah. A scanner, you're not as important as me. No. <laughs> no, <it is. laughs> I've been to every room and they want me to go away because they're working. <laughs> They very politely want me to go away. Can you, could you open the Zoom meeting, please, as I cannot open it? Yeah, uh, I think it, it's depending from the sharing screen. So I, I, I can stop, I can stop sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, leave me the mouse. Okay, please. Thank you. Okay. Stop share. Okay, yeah. maybe you have the control, right? Uh, now, no, I stopped, uh, you stopped sharing. Yeah, sharing the screen, but I think you can take the control, no? Uh, without sharing the screen, no. Oh, okay. Uh, Just a moment. The time is up. Shall I call them back? Yeah, okay, fine. We will solve it uh, then. Uh, I'll, I'll send you another link now with a different software, so I can take the control without disconnecting the Zoom. Okay. Just a moment, but for the rooms, shall I call them back? Sarah? Close the rooms. For the sake of the program, I think we probably need to, even though they've not had much time, but they can uh, continue to discuss this later, I think. Is, yeah, let's, let's try to move, because it's already 10.30. Yeah, let's... Can you, I just sent you a link for uh, a software uh, named AnyDesk. Just click the link, you will have download option. Please download it. And once yeah. you, once yeah, it's- uh, I already have this software. Yeah. Send me the uh, nine digits yeah. that you will have, so I can connect to your device. Okay. Is two nine six nine five zero three two two. Just just a moment, please. Yeah, I think we need uh, another five minutes. We didn't finish our work. Uh, uh, I believe so too. No, it. Uh, I I recognize nobody had enough time for this first exercise. But we will get we will get quicker about putting you into rooms and giving you more time. Over this week, there will be time to to either today as we do the next exercise or in the days to come, there will be more time to finish this properly. Don't worry. Um, uh, hi, Sarah. Uh, 
yeah, maybe we need more time, but uh, maybe the issue was we first introduced ourselves because we didn't know most of the people in the room and some technical issue. And then we needed to understand, like to have common ground interest. And I believe that maybe we don't need more time now to go to the room, but maybe it's good after we discuss together to, to highlight it now. And because really we had different uh, discussions on the uh, concept of like monitoring or what's safe or what is it and who would, would be in the management or the monitoring or uh, to be informed. So maybe if we discuss here in public, it would be much better to exchange the ideas. Yeah, um, unfortunately, we have such a difficult time with the program trying to do everything in these these half days. Ah. So apologies when sometimes things feel a little rushed. I want to reassure you that we'll get better at putting you in the groups. And also, I um, I don't know if you've uh, received the program on day day. Well, every day there are now times for the groups. Uh -huh. But on day five in particular, we have a much longer session where you can bring together all of your thoughts. So anything that you don't complete in, um, in these moments, we can on day five finish everything and you can feel confident that you've understood all of the work we're doing. I also know that you're very busy people, but um, in other courses, sometimes the groups have met also in their spare time and have continued to Zoom privately at their lunch times and other things but that is entirely <laughs> your choice. But in the past, everyone has become very excited by the course and then wanted to uh, continue working in their free time. So we will definitely have some more moments in the course, but you are also welcome to continue having big thoughts all the time, every day, not just for that. So just a relevant question. So the groups will be the same uh, along the course? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that each each part each day you can continue your conversations and hopefully you'll begin to see how each exercise builds together. They will connect. Okay. Um, I'm looking at colleagues who sat in in the office. I love it. If you're happy for me to continue with the program because we are a little bit behind schedule now, are you okay if I do the next presentation? Okay, you are lucky you have one more presentation from me, but it is quite short. And then for the rest of the morning, there's more Escania. Um, so let me share my screen again. Okay, we, we are about to start talking about the heritage of place. For the rest of the morning, we've started thinking about people. But now we're going to turn our attention to the heritage place. And um, as I talked about, we're going to talk about values, first of all, and then uh, values and attributes with the scania. I've ended up totally changing my presentation on last night, very last minute, to try to address some of the questions and discussions we started yesterday. So I'm hoping to give you um, a series of examples of World Heritage properties where values are important, but I'm hoping that you will see that these are not issues where there are simple answers. These case studies are more to provoke your thinking and to provoke your discussion in your groups. Um, and you will also see that like uh, the people-centered approaches, values is something that we're doing in management all the time. If we're doing good management based on values, we'll also do good impact assessment based on values. The things are very connected. And the other issue that came up yesterday was the question of buffer zones, whether something is happening in the property, the buffer zone, or even the wider setting is something that lots of places are struggling to deal with. And the advisory bodies in particular are avoiding <laughs> discussing buffer zones and setting because it is, it is a challenge globally. So I've tried to pull up together some examples which might make our discussion more concrete. Um, but it's worth us remembering, again, there was another comment yesterday and hopefully things will be clearer thanks to your Arabic fast, high speed discussion this morning. There was a question yesterday about integrity and authenticity. 
this is a slide some of you will have seen before. Um, what exactly is this outstanding universal value? We need to remember that the, the criteria is, it, uh, is one issue, what type of property it is, why it's been listed for a particular reason. The integrity and the authenticity are also important, but so is protection and management. So the question yesterday about how, how do we think about integrity and authenticity in any of the statements of outstanding universal value, there will be a text written on all of these and together they form the OUV. But it's really important to note that the protection and management is part of that. If we're not protecting things and managing them well, and obviously this includes impact assessment, the whole thing collapses. Okay, so this, we're very much trying to consider all these issues as interrelated. And um, this part of values we mentioned yesterday is uh, what is called in environmental impact assessment, it would be the baseline assessment. It is when you go to a place and you understand what is important and you understand, uh, you look at the research that's been done, you try to understand if new research is needed to really understand the issues. And once we've done that, that should be a shared understanding of that heritage place that goes into many different areas. The upstream processes is um, when something is nominated, when it goes onto a tentative list and you're preparing a nomination file these considerations should already be taking place. Why is the heritage important? What are the values? What is the uh, OUV going to be? And this will then inform management. It will inform in impact assessment, many different things. And then, so these case studies should show that the way other properties are trying to deal with values, not always well, but some, uh, as I say, case studies that will provoke your thinking. Now I start with the frontiers of the Roman Empire, which is a property both in Britain and in Germany. And the whole concept is that the Romans built big walls across the edges of their empires. Uh, and as you can see the examples in Britain here. Here's a part in Germany as well. It's a huge site. So for those of you interested in huge properties and huge buffer zones, this is one that goes beyond an individual country. Um, we are going to look in particular at Hadrian's Wall, which is in Britain, the lower of the red lines. You can see it is uh, a wall even today where there's some structure for the whole length of it and some of it is archaeology, but it still stretches across the whole of northern England. And it was inscribed, this is from its statement of outstanding universal value. One of the issues they raise in the central section, you will see it says, Adrian's wall runs through open country and it survives as part of a landscape. And this is some of the important features of this OUV. Now, this is a challenge now for the people managing it because if you see the two blue arrows, these are two places where it was decided to place wind farms. In Britain now, everything is now having wind, wind towers put there for new energy sources. And the people managing the property have had a series of requests for impact assessments to see if it's appropriate to put wind farms next to the World Heritage property. And obviously we've just looked at the statement of OUV, which talks about landscape, open landscape, not built industrial <laughs> landscape. So this has been a big challenge for them to know what to do and do it in a way that responds to the OUV. Uh, this is one um, uh, impact assessment for, uh, sorry, the central section. If you see the, the, there's one towards the sea, one site that was chosen towards the sea and one blue arrow showing uh, a, a location in the middle of the country. And these are the views, the existing view out from the wall, and then the prediction below of whether or not you could see the wind farms. In this case, 
what they did with the, the views. Visual impact is not always the most important impact, but in this case, it was felt that it was the only impact that would possibly occur. And the idea that you'd had Roman soldiers looking out across the countryside, what would they see? And would the wind farm be a problem? In this case, as you can see, it's actually rolling landscape, as in it goes up and down. And the wind farms are not really particularly visible as a result. But it was also felt that because of this difficult terrain, it was not ever considered in Roman times a strategic location for looking out. They did a lot of study behind what I'm showing in two minutes. And therefore, it was not a big deal if you put the wind farm. That's what the conclusion was. Instead, at the second location, again, it's the same World Heritage property, the same OUV, but the second location was near to the coastal portion. Now, what you can see here, the red rectangles are towers. They were lookout towers. And the wind farm was uh, right in the... Uh, outside the buffer zone, but right in the center of this series of lookout towers. In this case, the towers were built to look out at an empty landscape and check if the invading barbarians from the north were coming. In this case, it made a huge difference if you put a very visible wind farm there. Um, you were no longer experiencing it as they would have in the Romans. So in this case, they said no in the impact assessment. I found this very interesting because you have the same property, the same OUV and the same type of project, but the analysis was different based on looking at the individual attributes of that property and what was appropriate and not appropriate. I come this time to Korea, where there is a serial site of Confucian academies. The thing to know about these is that when Confucianism was creating its academies, they were deliberately situated near mountains and next to rivers, and it was part of the uh, learning environment. Uh, here, it's uh, again, the OUV goes into details about the fact, if you look at the bottom, there were the, one of the big factors about the location is the landscape. They need to be connected to the mountains and the water. Now, this is one of them. Byongsan was one of the properties put together. Uh, there's six or seven of these. And there was an analysis done of what the property would look like. And they've identified the buildings. During the nomination process, there was obviously the discussion of the buffer zone, what would that look like? Um, lots of analysis was done. You can hear, you can see here better the connection to the river in front and the mountain behind. And the fact that the pavilions are very transparent, there's viewpoints that go right through them. So the connection is ever present. When they discussed the buffer zone, this was the original idea. I've got a group of buildings, they're historic. I will put, uh, sorry, this was the, the this was the core zone, but the buffer zone was very similar. The idea was simply to protect the buildings. And during the time of the nomination, this ended up being a very big discussion with the advisory bodies. And what you have now is the property uh, line extends across the river and up across to the mountain in front. This is, uh, the red line is the nominated property. And as you can see, it now uh, is, much better at understanding what were the values of this place. It was all about the Confucian monks sitting within the buildings, but looking out across the landscape. Now, in this case, they did this. This is a very new nomination, 2019, it went on the list. The discussion was very relevant because they wanted to avoid getting to impact assessment level. They wanted to already say, we need to protect this view and the building on the other side of the mountain doesn't matter, but it does matter if it's directly in front of the building complex. They, they also then went and defined the buffer zone, which you see in green. So taking actually, um, there was a lot of analysis about what could happen in the immediate surrounding area to take away from what is meant to be a very tranquil landscape and ensuring that the values that they were writing into their OUV statement 
corresponded to what they were protecting. So for any of you working with tentative list things, you will find this a uh, very interesting uh, example of where they really tried to understand future potential problems before they got to an assessment. And what's interesting in this case is that by including more of the mountain landscape, they've actually got huge advantages because it's not just World Heritage having to defend its own buffer zone because often we get left out. By including mountains, they already have mountain legislation, which requires all new development to be assessed with impact assessment. So without having the heritage people having to always do the work, they're now relying on their colleagues in other ministries and departments to do assessments for them. So there's an extra layer of protection, thanks to the fact that they understood the values. There's a second example from Korea, which is uh, similar. This instead is a fortress on top of a mountain. At this particular time in Korean history, they were mostly worried about um, invasions from China. Yeah, so you've got massive fortress structures. Um, in, within the fortress, there are many historic buildings. And again, there was a discussion about whether to put a line on a map around the buildings, whether that was enough. In actual fact, this is what they've come up with as their, their property line and their buffer zone. Again, it was all to do with what was important to the values. You were in a fortress, you were looking out over landscape, and therefore we need to protect that landscape. The line of the buffer zone is the line of the mountain peaks. It is what the defending uh, soldiers within the fortress would have been looking at. And you can see there's a small area at the bottom, another little tiny element of the property. And this was in actual fact uh, a, a mountain peak on the other side of the valley, which had direct, um, is where the Chinese wanted to, to go and shoot their cannons <laughs> to the fortress. So it's part of the whole story of the property and therefore needs protecting. And again, in this case, it has all been uh, consideration of buffer zones in light of avoiding ever getting to an impact assessment if possible and if an impact assessment happens to deal with it intelligently. Uh, now to Cyprus. This instead was put on the list a long time ago, a lot earlier. I think this is a 1980s uh, listing and for those of you familiar with World Heritage, the OUV was not defined particularly well in the early um, situations. It wasn't required. The statement wasn't required. So sometimes it was felt these things were obvious, that they were important for very clear reasons. And the churches in the Trudos region of Cyprus were listed because of their paintings, their Byzantine paintings. Unfortunately, in this case, it means that you forget that the paintings are part of a religious context, which is still in use today. And they're part of historic buildings which have a value in themselves. And they're part of communities which continue to worship in the same places for generations, for centuries. And it's all part of a wider cultural landscape and it was very difficult when they went back and wrote their statement to bring all of this detail in. And um, we were involved in management planning for this property and the lack of, let's say, vision on the, in the OUV meant that development in this context is very difficult to talk about. It's simply not in the statement and yet the churches are dependent on that setting. When we did the values and uh, attributes analysis in this case, what you see highlighted in yellow are all of the attributes which are actually related to that country, that mountain landscape. So from the fact that there were, um, there were processions and pilgrimage routes to the fact that the wall paintings themselves were made with mineral resources that you can only find in those mountains, you don't need to understand the details of this property to understand that it's very interrelated to its wider setting and it needed protecting. 
but it becomes very difficult at the stage of your management plan to do that. And they are in fact finding it very difficult with different development projects now because it's hard to demonstrate why it's a problem to build massive new buildings right next to your church if you haven't thought about it clearly. In this case, they're actually quite lucky because there's another UNESCO designation, the Geopark, and that mountain area has actually now become a geopark. The geopark system is actually incredibly good at looking at sustainable development issues. And in this case, they've been saved largely because of this designation, not World Heritage. But that would suggest that the World Heritage is a missed opportunity for talking about what can happen in and around the property and what changes are good and what changes need to be looked at better. Which makes me want to remind you all that uh, we all love World Heritage here, but UNESCO is responsible for many key conventions and programmes and they can work together and they can reinforce each other. So I give you another example here where uh, in this case we're in Nesaba in Bulgaria and I went on an advisory mission here on behalf of uh, ICOMOS for the World Heritage Convention but it was a joint mission with colleagues from the Underwater Convention. So it was, in, um, it was a very nice example. Again, the World Heritage talks about lots of nice old buildings. And um, the property is this peninsula and um, the area of the World Heritage property is a line drawn around the island pretty much with its old buildings in the middle. Fortunately for them, the one thing that has saved them has been this mention at the bottom that it is today a vibrant urban organism. This is saving them from having um, all the life destroyed because they couldn't do anything when they were only looking at old buildings. And the modern population has been leaving, like in many of our very old centres, it becomes difficult to live in certain conditions if everything is frozen. But in some cases, the development is not healthy for the World Heritage property. Uh, so here we see a map. As I said, the, the, um, you can see the line on the map, which is the core zone, is just around the island pretty much, and the buffer zone is the red line to the left. Unfortunately, when there's been um, difficulty with development outside of the core zone, you can see these areas that are developing in out into the sea, because the World Heritage is only thinking about the buildings and was not thinking about the fact that this is definitely a settlement which is defined by the sea. This isn't mentioned anywhere. It means that development is allowed to continue and it's very difficult from a World Heritage perspective to say stop. In this case, it was only being um, because we were reinforced by the underwater convention that we had a chance to talk about what was special about this particular property, how important it was to maintain its connection with the sea in a healthy way and not to allow development to uh, really change what is a very important place. So in the last two examples, we have early inscriptions where the lesson that we should be learning for the future is that we cannot deal uh, with our impact assessments well if we're only thinking about OUV and the OUV is not working well. Um, we find it difficult for impact assessment and it is difficult as well uh, from the other point of view that it can almost freeze life for the local community. So it doesn't work for the community and it doesn't work uh, for stopping inappropriate developments either. So all of you working on tentative list, please get your, your statement of AUV right. I've just got uh, two very quick uh, examples left. Instead, here we are in Montenegro, where uh, we had the good fortune to go and do a very similar course to this one, but in person. Uh, it's a very beautiful location. What you can see is a bay that comes in off the sea with a historic town. And it's actually two World Heritage um, properties together. 
what they find in their uh, statement of AUV, this is the most beautiful bit. They talk a lot about obviously the historic settlement and how it developed with its landscape. And at the bottom, my favorite part was that good town planning is part of their OUV. So for those of you who are, who are urban planners here, this will be the statement of outstanding universal values that you love the most. The problem is if good town planning and the way that uh, human settlement is well integrated into the natural landscape, if that is your OUV, you have an even greater responsibility when new development occurs. So this is the type of uh, historic settlement that has been there in uh, specific locations where the landscape has a little narrow shelf between the mountain and the sea, there has been settlement. What they're struggling with now is new developments carving into that, um, those, uh, the mountain slope, and it's a very different feeling to it. And Kotor is actually very interesting from an impact assessment perspective because they have designed legislation to deal specifically with heritage impact assessments. They've had something like six in the last few years that have been asked by the committee, but they're struggling. And it's only now that they're getting a better understanding of what are the values of the place and they're using this statement of OUV better that they're being able to say no to some of these inappropriate developments. And my last example, um, Vega is in Norway, and this is a project that Escania and I have just started working on. And the whole part of this, um, the values of this place is the way that humans have been living in a very difficult environment. I'm showing you the the sunny version, not the northern snow version. Uh, humans interacting with the natural resources are managing to live here because they have had, you'll see it's the last line, maintained a sustainable way of working with that environment. Um, here, I don't want to comment too much because this is an ongoing project and we haven't reached conclusions uh, and certainly haven't got public conclusions. But if you look at this map, you'll see that the, the dark line is the property. So we're looking at Norway, it's a whole series of islands off the coast of Norway. And the buffer zone is the dotted line, slightly extending out. The problem that they're facing is they have values based on humans living sustainably in a natural context. This is a cultural landscape. And if you look here, the red dots are all the existing fish farms and the current HIA is looking at the blue dots which are proposed fish farms. Now although as I say we haven't reached any conclusions the work is ongoing but fish farming generally among the scientific community is considered to be not very sustainable because it's such an intensive uh, way of, of uh, fishing to put something that is perhaps unsustainable within a property, which the OUV itself is about sustainability, is very problematic. And this is the reason that they're requiring an impact assessment. So I think that is the end of my examples. Um, obviously, I have chosen a very random selection of places where uh, Ascanio, I and Eugene have worked, so we know them well. But I think you'll probably begin to see that these are issues facing World Heritage properties everywhere. The OUV can be good and it can be bad, and it can sometimes be totally ignored in our conversations. But we need to be better at describing what are the values um, and working better to make sure that we're making decisions about change based on what is the special nature of that particular place. So I think that's enough from me. I don't know if there is, uh, if it's a good idea to have questions now, or perhaps Ascanio's next presentation actually links into this discussion of values and attributes. It might be more intelligent to link directly to Ascanio if, unless anyone has anything some urgent questions on this.
I can see Hannah already does. <laughs> There's a question from uh, Hannah. Uh, I just wanted uh, to ask, uh, does the heritage materials affect the limits of the buffer zone and would it have any effect uh, on it if it's uh, important, uh, imported from another city or country? So, um, sorry, your, your question is if, if things happening in the buffer zone could affect the property. No, I mean, if the materials that are used in the property, yes. uh, if it uh, does it affect the buffer zone and would it affect the buffer zone if it's imported from another, from a near city or from another country? I, I think that's probably another question where it depends on the property. If there, if there are specific reasons why a a material in question needs to be used in that context or not. So again, it might be that the values of the place make a difference. I know it's very frustrating that we, we will always say maybe, yes, no. <laughs> but um, I think when we start to explore in more detail the values, it gives us a reason to say yes or no to these questions about what's appropriate and not appropriate. In some cases, it might not matter. In some cases, you might have materials which are very specific to that place, and you want to keep the, um, you you want to maintain that. So I'm afraid I think that's another question of uh, context is everything. Yes, maybe the, the example from Norway, Sarah, uh, it's good for this. Uh, if you think about ducks, for example, no, and uh, the pume, uh, how do you say pume? Uh, feathers. feathers. Yes, coming from the ducks, so it's it could be considered as a material from the property, but in this case, is an attribute of uh, a certain kind of values, natural values connected with the cultural values connected to the community that, that live uh, behind this uh, uh, this environment. Environment, no. Hi, Sarah. I have a question, if possible. Um, when talking about OUV and talking about the values, uh, at this level, uh, how we can involve the local community in this process? Actually, uh, when we are working like in important sites here in Palestine, we really consider about or discussing the OUV or the values and really the local people are not part of this discussion. So I really want to know how we can involve them as long as we are talking about sustainable development and the local community and participatory uh, approach. And is it really important to involve them from the beginning or because some of the site when we even, I looked at the site you presented and most of the buffer zone are not within like built up area. Okay, this is for the protection and conservation, but uh, really how we can save the values for the local people if they're not involved from the beginning. Thank you. I, I think it's a, it's a good question because unfortunately we have many examples where it's not been done. The example in Cyprus was an inscription done by very knowledgeable specialists, but the community wasn't involved. So you have an inscription based on paintings and not based on the use of the churches as the home of local community spirituality. So we missed lots of things. So I think it is very important that it's done early on. Often it's complementary to the knowledge that specialists bring and it gives you much, it, it simply enriches your understanding of the place. So it's, uh, these days it is always considered, when you're listing somewhere, it is considered that already in the nomination phase, the community should be involved and should be aware of what's happening and can contribute. But I think the discussion of this will tie into our next exercise because we're going to be looking very specifically linking with the stakeholders to the values. So you might find that's uh, a useful point of discussion too. Uh, before we get to the other presentation, Sarah, uh, Dr. Ahmed has a comment. Okay, 
Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And uh, I just have a comment on the local community involvement, actually, which is uh, Dr. Zahra raised on. I think, um, you know, uh, speaking about local communities uh, is, is very, uh, uh, I can see it's very accurate and very important here. And we have to take into consideration always the culture. Uh, speaking about local communities in Europe, actually different from local communities in Palestine or in, in the East, okay? And here uh, it might, uh, uh, you know, come to, uh, let's say the awareness itself. And un unfortunately, uh, if we take our experience in Palestine, uh, and dealing with local communities. We tried actually to, to use uh, such methodologies and uh, in order to involve uh, local communities. But unfortunately, uh, lo our local communities here are not uh, well aware uh, of uh, the either, uh, for, uh, for the, uh, the um, I, I mean, uh, aware of the values or aware for their benefits from the sites. So uh, it's, it's not easy. Might be we can speak about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, how, how we can involve them. You know, this is very important. Who are the local communities, actually? Uh, as you said, it's not, not only the people themselves, but the institutions as well uh, can, can, can be part of the, uh, the local community. And if we take, for instance, our experience in Batir when we prepared the management and conservation plan, it was really very hard to get people, you know, to our workshops to be involved. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we tried to find other solutions, our, our uh, or other uh, techniques. For instance, we use the social media, okay, in order just to consult them and involve them. And then uh, we uh, enforced actually to have a focus group, uh, we called it from the local community. To, uh, uh, this is the minimum, you know, the, uh, what I'm, uh, I'm trying to, uh, to say here, so we should differentiate, you know, between local communities in the East Okay, in, in our area, especially in Palestine or uh, uh, other Arab countries, and uh, the uh, the local communities might be in Europe. So uh, the methodologies and the work on this issue that's very important. But it's not. Uh, I'm not saying it's not uh, uh, very important, or I'm not going to underestimate. You know the the issue of local communities, but we should know how we are going to approach them, how we are going to consult them. At least uh, I can say the minimum. You know, but uh, this issue even is important, but uh, should should not be taken as the most important issue. Uh, unfortunately, I'm saying that because this is our uh, actually experience with local communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Mohammed uh, has a comment on this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. I uh, agree with you concerning the uh, level of awareness that we have to probably all work together with the communities to uh, tell them more information about the heritage situated around them. But I would like to highlight something uh, related to a practical case we have uh, on the tentative list, which is the um, throne villages. Uh, all of us here, I mean, uh, I'm talking to uh, also Sarah and Ascanio, uh, we have those villages which used to be during the Ottoman period, uh, 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 like the places of rulers of uh, um, villages around, and they were responsible of collecting taxes, on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. And they left uh, like big mansions, uh, structures, nice one architecturally. Uh, they are uh, existing in uh, more than like 13 or 14 uh, uh, villages uh, across uh, Palestine. And they were linked with families who have been uh, ruling other families, uh, collecting uh, their livelihoods and uh, 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 and actually uh, getting into bloody wars and conflicts between other family with other families and they are uh, leaving good uh, um, 
I would say, good um, uh, heritage in terms of uh, architectural value. But in terms of human practices, if you ask some of the families living there, what is their reflection uh, uh, and what is their point of view and what is their value uh, or how they value these uh, uh, mansions, they would disagree with you directly and would say this is this is uh, connected to uh, our uh, like sad history. How come that this family would be important for all of us while they were responsible of uh, giving our ancestors hard times? So this is the value we the value we see from our side is completely uh, like uh, uh, like um, comprehensive in terms of architecture and history but if, in terms of the opinion of the local communities it is not necessarily the case and this is what I, why, why why I wanted to say that probably it's not about awareness also about the reflection of people uh, towards this heritage thank you um, I just want to make another comment uh, in continuation to what Muhammad was saying. Uh, also, when we were working on the villages in uh, Jerusalem villages, northwest, also there were, there were these families which had this kind of power and built this kind of mansions, and they had this kind of relation with the uh, ruling systems uh, during different dynasties and different eras. So um, we were amazed with architecture and it took really a very important part of the way we planned our intervention in one of these uh, villages. But when we started our oral history sessions, it turned out it had this very dark history. So sometimes you don't need to listen to the formal narrative or to those who are in power to influence your decisions. You really need to work more time and more in um, very close relation with the people on ground who have this kind of personal narratives which can really open up different kind of understanding of what is this heritage that we are talking about here. This very much connects to what Sarah was saying at the very beginning that uh, we have the uh, the, the community of the locals that uh, more or less give the uh, uh, the most valuable value on, uh, to the site. Uh, there are two questions from Marwa and from uh, Murad. Uh, if we can have those two questions and uh, proceed with the uh, upcoming presentation because we are short in time. Uh, Marwa and then Murad, please. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my question, I have a question and a recommendation uh, actually. Uh, my question is about the kind or the size uh, or interventions that use the heritage impact assessment. Uh, you know, uh, according to operational guidelines, the intervention or the new development needs uh, an impact assessment. But uh, for us as uh, site managers in World Heritage uh, sites, every day we get a um, uh, new projects, new interventions, infrastructure projects, restoration projects. Uh, is there uh, a checklist or a criteria to decide when we shall go to impact assessment and uh, when shall not? Uh, my recommendation uh, actually apply the values and attributes. Uh, I have uh, worked uh, in World Heritage uh, Division in the Ministry of Tourism for four uh, years. Uh, and uh, this issue, the values and attributes, is very complicated issue. Uh, I recommend the UNESCO Ramallah Office and the uh, uh, World Leadership Program if they uh, executed a specialized uh, training course and how to identify uh, the values and attributes, uh, the OUB and other values, and how we can label uh, these values and uh, give priorities, uh, and who will uh, in uh, such an uh, identification of values and attributes. Thank you. No, the, the very quick response is you've made a very good point, but the next session is going to be precisely on these values and attributes. So I think you'll have uh, some answers there and perhaps we continue, if it's not clear afterwards, then we continue the question. Yes, I, I think some, some answers will be given in the next presentation about 
what you're saying in this uh, last comment. Mostly about uh, grading values, understanding uh, if there is a grading, is understanding relationships between values. So, next step. Thank you, Sara Dascanio. Murat Tamimi, you had a question? Murad, is a few can you tell us what I'm saying? Also, I want to ask uh, to thank Dr. Ahmed Arjoub. Just I have a little bit, yani, yani disagree with him uh, about uh, the community, the local community of Palestine, because uh, as Sarah mentioned in the first, that heritage and culture is created by people for the people. Okay, and the stakeholders, as 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 the, you saw us in the first exercise, that we have to mention the the, the stakeholder, and we have to decide and to think smartly when and how to deal with them. So I don't see that there is a huge or there is any difference between the local communities of West Bank or Palestine, or the local community of Europe. I, I really, I, I really yani, love the European people. Just I didn't saw them yani, yani, better in anything according to the local community there or here. As, as, as you mentioned, Sarah, in Cyprus, I guess, we didn't uh, mention or use or deal with the, with the local community in the first and you face the problem in the end. So it's the, the story of when and how to deal with the local community. The Palestinian, they are so great with the respecting and preserving their, uh, their heritage. Uh, Till today, the Palestinian, they, they, they conserve their the heritage and they present it very well to all the world. And it's the, the local, I mean the, the communities, much better than us, the municipalities, and much better than the government itself. So this is the point. Thank you very much. And excuse me, Mr. Dr. Ahmed, if, if, I, if I said something, uh, disagree you. No, no, I, I'm just, I'm not going to, to, to reply, actually, just to clarify the issue. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, that our local community is this important and European community. No, it's not like that, actually. Uh, you know, um, when we are dealing with, uh, uh, with such methodologies, actually, uh, speaking about management, conservation plans, uh, to be honest, all of, of such methodologies for our work is invented uh, in the West, okay? So when we, uh, we are going to deal with them, we should uh, adapt them to our, our local, uh, you know, uh, situation. Uh, and I, I said we should find, might be uh, some uh, methodologies, uh, some uh, techniques, you know, uh, to attract our local people, okay, and uh, to, uh, to have some, or to raise their public awareness uh, about this issue. So, uh, sorry, I just uh, <laughs> clarify this issue. I'm not uh, underestimating our community, okay? So, this is just uh, uh, European methodologies. We should actually update them to our local uh, situation and circumstances. So, th thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Maybe we can uh, uh, proceed with uh, the next presentation with Ascanio, please, because uh, we're losing time. Thank you all. Yeah, okay, I'm going to share the screen. Okay, uh, this last two presentation uh, will go deeply inside the problem. And uh, you, you have seen that exists uh, problematic issues related to uh, identifying uh, values uh, and uh, understanding exactly what, what is the meaning of this uh, approach. Um, that will last uh, not so long, about 15 minutes. So I will try to go fast but we have, because we will have a, a big exercise at the end but we can uh, make discussion during the exercise uh, first of all uh, the 
the thing that I want to highlight is that uh, the concept of values and the attributes <laughs> is not alone. It's a, a completely connected with the main, obviously, con uh, concept of OUV, the understanding of universal values, but mainly with the meaning of significance. Uh, we already have uh, uh, here by, by Sarah and other uh, participants uh, this meaning the significance, but what exactly are the relationship between value attributes uh, uh, and uh, significance uh, inside the OUV uh, arguments? Uh, if we start from the <clears throat> definition of the, um, the term, we can simply uh, define as a, uh, the value as something that is held to the serve. So the importance, the worth of, you, of something. But if you go maybe also deeply, <coughs> it could be considered as a standard of behavior, or as we have seen, a judgment of what is important. And uh, this, once you define as important something, you also are defining if it could be beneficial or not for something else. We argue that, and uh, for example, the example that Mohammed uh, told us about uh, value is a concept, a relative context, uh, not so objective. And it comes from different levels, uh, from individual to universal, from communities, we can say, to professional, to practitioner. So it's a very uh, problematic uh, um, concept to manage and to um, uh, argue a statement exactly uh, based on uh, what we are thinking about this uh, uh, particular aspect of the uh, archaeological side uh, or architectural side. Uh, it also involved obviously different perspectives so in this sense. So it depends on the, the perspective from professional, from community, as we, as, uh, we have seen from uh, Sarah's presentation and your comments, your experience uh, working with uh, uh, different uh, stakeholders around uh, the heritage sector. And uh, third, last but not least, uh, it's a concept that is uh, differing uh, through the time and we will see these uh, in some examples. So this is, uh, you have to keep in mind this because uh, uh, analyzing the, 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 the site, the World Heritage site, the time of, uh, 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 the, the time half-sec is also a, a very big component to understand exactly the evolution of the uh, people around this site and the site itself. So understanding value is, uh, in general, an ongoing process. We learn by ourselves, we learn, each of you have the experience, but I just want to point these three main uh, uh, characteristics of this very difficult concept. Uh, going through significance, so the, the main uh, uh, content of these uh, values attributes relationship, it can be defined, it can, it can be defined as a importance, the consequence. So we can translate uh, the significant is uh, what is the meaning of what we, we are uh, giving value. And the combination of all the values, so their meaning and the attributes that carry out these, uh, these values, this could be considered as the significant as a wall. This is very important. It's not uh, only an intellectual uh, joke, uh, but it's very important once you go, we are going to the assessment process because we always have to uh, understand in which um, folder you are, in which um, area of the, of, of the system you are. Over time, obviously, there have been various tools to develop uh, the, and express the significance, and, but each tool, and I want to repeat this, is a product of the time. Uh, values and culture that produced it. So we always have to take in consideration these aspects uh, in order not to uh, focus uh, mostly on this, on this, just because it's a choice. Uh, it's never a choice from cognition. It's uh, understanding when it happens, why it happens, and how it happens. As uh, I don't remember who uh, mentioned this, why and how. 
um, uh, the criteria used to, to group heritage to compare values in these models uh, obviously could be the age and era, as we said, the, phys the uh, physical typology, the historical themes, the shapes, the architectural forms, uh, social, cultural, economic uh, uh, origin of these uh, uh, significance. Um, so the last question, and maybe someone of you has, uh, has told, uh, has made this, this question, uh, what does the has, this heritage represent and how is it comparable with other heritage? This main question we always should ask, even if we are the main experts in the world about uh, that site or other sites, we always have to face the problem starting from uh, a critical point of view. So starting uh, trying to understand every time what, what exactly these heritage represent for us, for the others, and for the, in the ancient time in the next, in the future time. Going through uh, our uh, context, so the outstanding universal values, that is a particular uh, approach uh, uh, inside the value-based approach. Uh, as we as we know this morning, uh, uh, you you rack up some terminology about this. Uh, so I just want to highlight that uh, outstanding universal value in our process of impact assessment should be our starting point. As as, as uh, Sarah pointed out, we have to start from the definition of the site, how it was described, and uh, read carefully and try to keep. The, to take all the information starting from this, why this, um, uh, this site is so exceptional. So uh, at the time of description of the property on the World Heritage List, the committee adopts a statement of an understanding universal values. And it is, this is the main tool that we have to going through our process. Um, the criteria uh, for the assessment of the outstanding universal values uh, can be directly or tangibly associated with events of living tradition. And this is all the issues related on what this is representing at the modern time, at the contemporary time, that heritage, the heritage that we are assessing, with ideas, with the beliefs, with artistic and literary works of this outstanding universal significance in this case. So that is to say the importance of these, uh, um, these values that we identify. Um, when deciding to describe the property, obviously the, the committee guided by the value well, adopts this statement. This statement is uh, uh, quite different in depending on the time of description. So you always have to pay attention uh, with the old description, uh, contemporary description, and new expression that require different uh, approaches and also more detailed uh, information about the reasons of the description. Uh, and a, a, a certain, uh, I, I just want to uh, highlight this definition that came out from the Bura Charter in 2004, uh, because uh, um, it enlarged a little bit uh, the, the approach towards this outstanding universal value. So it, the significance is the accepted formal method used by heritage organization and professional to describe the values that make a place important to a community. And this, this is important. It is a summary of the outcome of investigation into the place addressing all its values. And we come back to what we are saying yesterday, but also today with Sarah's presentation and your comments, uh, uh, while uh, uh, understanding a place, understanding uh, an heritage place, uh, we have to start, uh, World Heritage Site, we have to start from uh, OUV, obviously, but we have to address all its values, cultural and natural, because the connection between these uh, are uh, so important, has the outstanding universal values itself. And another line that I underline is uh, in a clear, easy to understand way, this is a very point uh, um, of interest for our process in assessment, because as you know, if you uh, cannot be so, uh, cannot express exactly the meaning of your identification, of your uh, uh, evaluation of impacts, etc., uh, and you can you cannot be clear and uh, organized and uh, um, analytical. Uh, 
give analytical information about your assessment, you cannot uh, uh, deal with it. Um, coming back, um, the statement of Sinia is not, uh, so we can summarize that is not uh, a statement that something is important, but as I said, it explains the why and how. How we can translate in our process, we can consider why all the issues related to identification of values and the how, obviously, the attributes. So the physical representation of uh, uh, the values that we, uh, uh, we were able to identify. In this case, uh, architectural buildings, uh, traditional intangible heritage. So keeping these two uh, switching between why and how uh, is the way to, to deal with uh, a good uh, Pro, uh, value process identification. Uh, but obviously, also in the case, we have to consider also to balance the strength to give to these two main components. This is not a joke of words uh, because uh, uh, it reflects also the way in which the results of your impact assessment came out. And I will give you an example. Uh, balancing uh, more efforts towards values and less towards attributes and or the contrary, it brings to giving a different meaning of the heritage site and to transfer also a different uh, solution to the impacts that you evaluated on these meanings. So uh, it's not, we can translate if you transfer a different uh, strength to the why and to the how, maybe it's uh, more simple to assess uh, the how because we can simply understand how a building was built, in which period, by whom, uh, what happens to it. And it's more difficult to understand the, the context, uh, what represents these uh, for the community in the past, in the present. So balancing the why and the how, the values and the attributes uh, brings to a good uh, uh, compromise to, to reach, uh, I, I want to say, at 19%, the, the really significance of that place. Um, going to the, uh, the process itself, uh, all this work that we can do, uh, identifying these uh, uh, two main components, uh, is obviously to create better awareness of the importance of the heritage among all stakeholders. What, is, uh, what you are saying about communities is very important. And I just want to say a comment about uh, Sarah's presentation, but also your comments. We don't have to consider all the communities good or all of the communities not. And exactly what they are bringing and uh, oh, oh, which are the interests in which we are, they involved. So creating awareness around this, obviously among the stakeholders, uh, could assist the decision making because you can create vision for the area, which is not only related to the uh, actual decision that you have to make tomorrow, but also in the long term. Uh, so giving manage management objectives, management strategies to, to point out and to share and to create uh, awareness about this. Um, in, uh, so the, um, for the stakeholders and those who, who, told, who hold the value to communicate about the area and its values it becomes a complete process, okay? Uh, the strength that we have to give for each component of this process, it depends on our awareness uh, and our analytical uh, um, uh, activities in identifying the values and the related attributes. First step, obviously, has a practitioner, uh, we can know, we know this, is the information gathering. So the research, the survey, the interviews, the discussion, meetings, that is very important because different point of view came out uh, very often. And the observation of the averages, that is very important when you uh, face the new uh, context. Uh, the gathering is uh, the first step, but as we will see in the next presentation about documentation, I, uh, it's a particular presentation, I, I, I will talk about this. The, uh, the data that we uh, gather should be analyzed, but it should be analyzed mostly um, because we need to provide analytical information uh, 
uh, that can demonstrate our results. So understanding this data, classif creating classification of the data, and creating uh, pri uh, priorities, and what is optional and what is not. Uh, these are all tools that uh, during the analysis allow us to uh, follow one path and to demonstrate this path in order to create the awareness, the right awareness around this choice. Um, obviously, the, the next step are developing tech, checking back to the stakeholders and reviewing in time uh, all the, the, the activity. Um, the main thing to consider, so what is the purpose of the statement of, for the management plan, heritage assessment, interpretation of plan, so uh, the why. Uh, it's not, it should not repeat the world history of the site, obviously, uh, because maybe you have collected so much information about this, but you don't have to uh, make the new story of the site. Uh, you have to identify who holds these values and who is the heritage important for, as all the, 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 the things that we have uh, seen <coughs> regarding the communities. Uh, the other important thing is consider all the values for a complete understanding. And, uh, and here it comes the, the practitioner skills, giving, uh, asking ourselves if there are priorities among these values. It's not, uh, this is a matter, uh, pro problematic matter, uh, because going through um, grading our values, uh, obviously, uh, Compromise the term, the the meaning of the of the entire site, giving a scale of priority on the, on these values. It's a very um, not so linear process, but we have to do it. Uh, we have to demonstrate why we choose this and not this out and the other one, and. Um, and this is the only way to come to uh, share it and to come to um, decision that could be shared among the, the other stakeholders. Um, what happens? I just want to give an example. What happens if, uh, as we have seen in the SAR example, I want just to give you another example why, when a misunderstanding values happen during an impact assessment process. This is the case of Liverpool Mercantile City of uh, uh, example. In this case, three HIA has been conducted uh, to assess the potential impact of the Liverpool Waters Development Project. Uh, two were positive and one were negative. <coughs> the positive one was proposed by the developer and by the city council can that really want uh, the development uh, to to go forward and the negative one by the english heritage uh, in this case what happens the inscription uh, of the the site this is you can see uh, before and after the development how could the uh, rendering with all the buildings uh, on the upper part of the images uh, this uh, part of the, the site was uh, in the statement described as a uh, um, uh, a great number of significant commercial, civic, and public buildings, including etc. etc. Uh, during the assessment, uh, developer and city council um, consider this uh, building has an historic layering sequence uh, around the area. This means that uh, their conclusion comes to, to say that uh, adding another layer to this uh, historic layer is not uh, damaging the OUV. Uh, instead, we are enhancing this. This is not exactly because uh, it's not just a matter of adding or removing some a layer in an area, so a building but it's a matter of the relationship of the historic values that this building represents. Uh, this comes obviously, in this case, the misunderstanding uh, uh, is not a, uh, a bad uh, conclusion what comes from the city council or from the developer. It's just a misunderstanding what are the real values of that place. Is not the uh, evolution in construction, in building, in adding uh, feeders to this area, uh, without understanding the connection between uh, the 
people living there and the development for future benefits or the impacts on, uh, for example, economic uh, uh, aspects. Going uh, mostly on the heritage sector, if we consider the heritage impact assessment, we are dealing during the first phase of values and attributes uh, uh, identification with the, as, as we said, with the outstanding minerals of value, more in detail with the statement of the OUV, that is the, our first look, that lead us to identify our values and related attributes. And in the next weeks, we will see the next steps, that is to say the impact, and we can translate uh, the opportunities coming from a certain development or the threats and the assessment uh, towards a sustainable development. These, are, these will be uh, arguments for next presentation in the next weeks. Uh, considering obviously the values, uh, we have also in this case to, uh, to find the right balance between uh, uh, the HOUV and the other heritage value. We, all, uh, we already talked about this, but it's very important to underline at, at each step. Um, from other values, we can consider also the behaviors, the, the youth partners, the local ownership identity, and in general, the people. So uh, it's always uh, a good uh, um, uh, step to starting from the UV, but not forget uh, about uh, considering uh, the wall context uh, uh, without at this stage uh, creating priorities between these, but just trying to identify and understand. Uh, because we can came out that uh, maybe sometimes it's not a problem to make difference between OUV and other values, but it could be only a question of reconciling these different values that maybe is misunderstood or is not at the same level or, or is description have a lax uh, because doesn't uh, have the chance to consider these other values that we are identifying. So uh, we always have to pay attention on this balancing. Um, in the AI process, in the AI um, impact assessment process, we are talking, I, I, I just try to uh, visualize and to create a graphics of the process. Uh, when we talk about UV, we are talking about values. When we talk about values, we can subdivide and assign to each values uh, their attributes. But what happens? These attributes uh, are not, uh, could be related one to itself, and one attribute could be related to two different values. This creates, obviously, uh, associative values that are not strictly related to one or to the other. And how, um, and this could create itself another new value associated to different attributes. This uh, um, comes to the question, what we are really assessing each time? And this question we have to make each, one, each time that we um, comes to define a value as a sentence, as a, an argumentation. Uh, we always have to make a step backward and what you are assessing, this is correct, uh, this is related with this, with this. Uh, I just want to give you this very simple example. This is a painting from St. Francis Church uh, in Italy. Uh, I, I took this because uh, I, I have a, a tour in this city and I saw this picture. And uh, this is, these paintings come from 13th centuries from the Giotto school. So it's a very important painting you know, um, in the middle time. Uh, and the church was rebuilt in 19th century, so 500 years later. And, um, but during the rebuild of these, uh, the, the workers uh, uh, have to, to create new plasters and have to um, detach the, the old one. And as you can see, they covered with their uh, weapon, with their, um, I, I don't know, with their tools, the, 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 the medial plaster, but they didn't touch the faces of the Jesus in this case of, or, or the saints. They only touched the uh, out boundaries of the faces. Uh, this led to me to think that uh, which, are, which are the real values and attributes in this case? We have certainly uh, aesthetic values from the medieval time 
thinking about the quality of the paintings. Uh, and so an aesthetic category is about aesthetic values uh, uh, related to the, uh, the attributes that we can identify with the painting itself. But when we came to the uh, 19th century, these values change because maybe it's not uh, a matter of aesthetic uh, and the quality of paintings in this case, but it's the religious uh, values that come across times. And uh, um, that is felt also by the communities that are going to uh, destroy this painting. So each time, time and uh, met and uh, people that interact with the heritage are the real uh, uh, players of our uh, um, activities in identification of the other. And uh, I really love uh, the question, which is which? Every time we have to uh, ask ourselves uh, uh, if we are going on the right, we have, if we are considering the wall or just a part of this. Um, obviously, there exist tools to do this process. And uh, in general, we can summarize, uh, as we have seen in the first step, the data and the professional judgment, the data that we gather and the professional judgment that we deal with. Data collection, and we will talk uh, more, uh, more in detail in the next presentation, uh, comes with the collection, representation, and analysis through the a very powerful uh, uh, management system and like the geographic information system. The, uh, the, the uh, adding the professional judgment, so uh, public consultation, systematic analysis, uh, intersectional, as we have seen yesterday during the presentation of the case studies, different uh, different skills for different, for different problems, uh, very specific mostly, uh, and the recommendation. This comes to bring us to give a grading and a classification of the importance of the assessment. This is very the, the real core of the process. Uh, once we have the data, once we have the, all the process deal, uh, done, we have to come to give priorities and grade our assessment in order to give uh, uh, mitigation and propose mitigation measures to the impact. Uh, we have seen yesterday the, the tools related to, uh, uh, to values and attributes. We can use standard uh, tools, but we can also do some changes. We talked yesterday about uh, uh, OUV and other values or potential OUV, uh, because we are dealing with uh, OUV that is uh, external uh, by, uh, of the property um, the, of the core zone. So we need this uh, new column to identify that something exists also outside. Uh, the holders, uh, who holds the values, we can adjust and add information to our tables in evaluating uh, our process. Uh, another standard toolkit is come from enhancing our heritage toolkit that was provided by IUCN in collaboration with other authorities, uh, heritage authorities, and um, is going to be updated. Uh, is uh, mainly not only focused on values, and that is a very big uh, uh, assessing management uh, uh, tool uh, that is, uh, and a part of this is uh, uh, related to values and attributes. And um, the high commercial guidelines, obviously, uh, the old one I, in this in this page is the the one coming from 2011. Uh, I just put this the appendix 3A because it's very important uh, to look at uh, as they propose uh, the grading of the our assessment after the identification of values. And you can read obviously about this uh, more in detail uh, directly on the assessment. Uh, uh, on the, on the guidance and uh, the new guidance and uh, it's part of your task and I'm coming to the end of this uh, part. Uh, you will be divided in uh, the groups that he has the, for the stakeholders exercise. Uh, you will, and uh, you will deal with the a first exercise that is the analyzing the statement of the outstanding earth of values and you have to follow uh, this um, this uh, extract from the new guidance that, that uh, Sarah and Eugene uh, are working with the, the World Leadership Program. And uh, second step, but uh, just uh, 
because it's first the second one, you have to fill the table of the values and attributes. Uh, in this case, uh, a short description is given, uh, identifying if it's uh, uh, OUV or not, uh, who hold these values, and listing the attributes. Uh, I will come later again on this table because I, you have to deal also with another exercise that is mapping the attributes, and uh, we will show uh, later. So I think this part of the um, presentation is uh, finished. Uh, if I look at the program, uh, there will be a break. It's right? Yes, uh, thank you, dear Ascani, for the presentation and the very practical tools that will help identifying the attributes and weighing the values uh, to respond to uh, Marwa's question and also very enlightening to, uh, to all the participants. Uh, we'll head to a break, and uh, I'll kindly ask you to uh, all leave the meeting and join again. Uh, we have a very short break, only for five minutes. Uh, we have some technical problems with the groups, so uh, if you can all leave the meeting and join again after the break. Uh, using the same link. Nan. Sorry, but I thought the meeting will be finished at one. Uh, we are we are late in the program. Uh, we will try to uh, squeeze all the upcoming sessions. But I have the meeting of uh, General Assembly for ECOMOS. It's at uh, now at one, so I have to be there. We can we 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 can um, go. You can continue maybe, but yeah, I, can't, I can continue yeah. with the other presentation very quickly and just present the group work. I think in twenty minutes we have to. We need other 15, 20 minutes. What do you think? Ascania, do you think that the group work we should do it today? Uh, should start today. Okay. Should start today and last for next days. Okay. Okay. Then we, I don't know if we need to break uh, since we have time here. For a break. No need for a break. It's Thursday. We we try always uh, to leave early, so we we can we can neglect the break and start. Uh... Yeah, okay, I can start. Okay, I, I will start with the next session. Is about documentation, okay, and try to go very fast. Okay. 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 Uh, you can see the screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This, this last part. I, I just want to to um, to put this presentation about documentation because I just want to point out, as you can imagine, I really care about data gathering and data analysis, as you can uh, have seen in our experience working together with Sarah. So I just want to point out uh, some uh, main concept uh, going through some experience. Um, the main concept is that all, also in this case we are not facing to simple uh, solution. So it doesn't exist a, 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 and only a single tool that can solve our problems, even if we are in the digital area, technological area. Um, data management consider, uh, consider the, the, the coming from the documentation, so all the data coming in, but uh, have to provide different uh, uh, outcomes uh, for different uh, uh, skills and uh, practitioner and different objectives, obviously, in this case. We can consider documentation uh, as uh, also in the case with, with different, in different ways, uh, mainly as a knowledge process, so gathering information about inventories, maps, surveys, uh, through our tools, databases, geographical information system, graphic documentation. These all create knowledge and awareness about uh, uh, our objective. In this case, uh, a world heritage site. Uh, documentation could, should must uh, uh, should be uh, considered as a, a responsibility towards uh, between the past and the future. You can uh, obviously imagine if we can if we if we can create the gaps uh, and this happens in the past. Um, uh, this creates also a gaps of uh, uh, knowledge about uh, what happens in that period. So uh, consider always your data gathering as a responsibility, not only 
for your own work. And finally, obviously, it's a, a big tool because it can provide quantitatives and qualities of your uh, process. And uh, needs, obviously, for decision making to, to evaluate cost benefits uh, and uh, people that should be involved for uh, the, the data gathering process. Uh, if we can go far, uh, we can, if we can read uh, about the definition of documentation uh, for the purpose of precise identification of the moments or uh, something else, uh, the maintenance of an inventory of its archaeological heritage and designation of protected monuments and areas, dissemination of knowledge in these cases to make to bring up to date surveys, inventories, and maps. These are all you can read after when we share the presentation. Uh, the presentation, the documentation itself could be defined as gathering and recording of information, but the purpose uh, is, is listed as follow to record the condition, if we are conservator, architect conservator, to record information, to record changes, uh, to provide information, to record agreements and understanding, to provide documents that can be available if and when required for legal purposes, in this case, as we have seen yesterday in the, the case study of Villa de Ava. Uh, in our context, uh, in HIA context, uh, documentation is related to the values and attributes representation. Uh, um, not forgetting, obviously, the standards, the knowledge, the responsibilities, as we have seen. Um, also, in this case, when we talk about uh, documentation, we are talking the people that are doing action and activities. And if we are talking about people, we are talking about processes that comes behind and, for, and uh, forward the documentation process. So uh, the process brings not only to a, uh, objective documentation, but in a really information management uh, context. And uh, if we talk about information management, we are talking also in this case, as we have seen for attributes and uh, uh, values, we are talking about relation. For example, if you consider uh, the approaching three different archives, in this case, uh, archaeological archives for the heritage inventors, the archaeology or drawing, um, and uh, we can relate different pieces of information coming from different archives, we are creating at uh, this point, uh, and is our ability to create this connection, a new information that can be added to the, our uh, um, identification of the single pieces. Uh, when we talk about information, we are talking is made up of three main elements, and we don't have to. We, we can't forget this uh, um, for uh, when we deal with uh, this kind of uh, activities. Uh, could be uh, the first element is the type, so the finite policy is that we give the selection is made, the value and the attribute, different from what you have seen. In this case, the, the value we intend the chosen element. For example, if you read the decay, the, the sentence, the decay of the mosaic is equal to four. In this case, the four is the chosen element between other elements and is the value that we are giving to these. Uh, mapping of decay in this case. And the attributes describes uh, is the meaning of deformation. If one of these elements is missing, there is no information. Uh, coming back to our, you remember the slides from yesterday, uh, the indication of values and attributes uh, that, uh, that define the values. So it's like different uh, what we have seen for the information typology uh, elements. And uh, through coming to the mitigation measures. Uh, and in the circular process, uh, um, the values and attributes are related at the level of the impacts and not only uh, in, the data, in the data gathering. In summarizing this uh, process, uh, we can say that uh, the, the wheel of documentation that goes, uh, that start firstly uh, at, uh, at the first stage of each uh, impact assessment process, uh, is the real will that can uh, uh, create awareness and uh, identify exact uh, with better knowledge the attributes that 
can represent the values. Obviously, in, the, in this kind of approach, uh, stopping this wheel, it means stopping knowing uh, the... Um, stopping awareness about her attributes and uh, obviously stopping uh, awareness about her values. Uh, the main sentence here we can, deep, uh, we can do uh, starting from this approach is how to describe these values, how to represent them, how to communicate and how to evaluate. Uh, documentation is the wheel that can make all these uh, mechanisms going uh, uh, forward. Um, we have seen that uh, uh, this, uh, the tools to carry out the, ass the assessment uh, is uh, half and half uh, the data gathering and the professional judgment. Regarding the data gathering, we talk about the geographic information system. So I just give you an example uh, what we intend for geographic information system. Uh, the system is a group of independent but interrelated elements compromising and unified wall for a defined suppose. The information, the a very main component and when we talk as we have seen in the first slide when we talk about information we are talking about the data and all the process that comes to record this data and uh, the geographic elements that is uh, a very important uh, uh, point uh, during uh, uh, also in more intelligent side because we have to locate and this will be part of your exercise uh, uh, during the uh, uh, during the, the next section. Um, uh, I don't know if I have to continue. Sorry. Yeah, do you, do you think I have to continue? Yeah? Yeah, okay. So, um, what is not what is when it's not uh, a GIS that uh, is not a digital map, but it's the understanding map is one of the uh, departure points, and uh, we don't have to uh, make the mistake of considering GIS as a, a software package, but always involves tools, people, and data. So uh, as the for the values approach, uh, we have to consider the data approach as a process involving. Uh, tools and people and uh, how to manage this. Uh, we go, uh, I go fast on this part because you can read uh, the slide uh, by, by yourself. It's just a matter uh, regarding the representation of your data and how to uh, manage with different kind of uh, uh, information that you can collect and um, the how it works. It works obviously as for the values and attributes uh, in layering your information and create a classification. Uh, the, 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 the relationship between these, all these layers uh, brings you to uh, understand better and construct a, a rep representation of your context of your other area of interest. Mm, just some example. Uh, we are talking uh, in, in this case uh, of the values and attributes uh, so uh, process. So we are talking what, considering uh, what is the matter of our impact? What is the, the object of the, our impact assessment? Uh, in this case, so remembering the, uh, the last uh, slide about uh, attributes and values, we are considering uh, the documentation related to the attribute that express values. We can't represent values itself in a map. We have to represent the attributes that brings to this, uh, uh, brings the, the, this value. So uh, just want to highlight this point because it's very important. It can create confusion during uh, uh, these steps of the uh, process. Um, obviously, these mapping attributes could be at different scale, at regional, national scale, at urban scale, like for example, in a vivid search uh, site, or at the site scale, or uh, in the wall scale, or very pavement scale, or very plaster scale. So very detailed mapping of all the feeders uh, uh, concerning that uh, specific object. Uh, just 
to give you some example here from uh, um, the Emirates of Abu Dhabi, a data collection to a data representation, uh, starting from the values and attributes table, uh, we where we we gone we we went to the uh, attributes collection, so documentation via aerial images, all the digital uh, tools that uh, can be provided at this uh, in this digital area, 3D models, also images, very detailed drawing. Coming inside a GIS, the GIS provides some tools that, for example, is uh, useful to uh, monitoring and to understand the change of the environment. In this case, is compared to two different uh, digital, uh, digital elevation model regarding the movement of the sands in the area. And this is very important because we can gather all this information with new technologies and we can uh, overlap and confront this. This creates because in this case, the sand itself is uh, an attribute of different values of the site. So uh, dealing with this data uh, allow us to uh, demonstrate uh, how the change over time happens in this site. Uh, the representation also of the values and attributes table uh, and um, uh, with graphs, etc. Um, but how we can represent the relationships? I just want to, uh, because we are talking attributes holders and, uh, and values. Uh, I just want to uh, point you to this website uh, that is a very uh, good um, project uh, from the Intangible Cultural Heritage from UNESCO. And uh, they really um, create a very good way to represent, in this case, for example, the threats towards uh, intangible heritage in some places of the world, or uh, uh, was able to describe the biomes and natural resources of certain places. So I, I, I don't want to go uh, inside the website. You can go following this uh, web address uh, and you can play with this uh, play, relative play. You can uh, interact with these uh, graphs, uh, really uh, focusing uh, very quickly which are the main problems. And uh, so a very good example for the representation of these uh, relationships that exist between things that we're assessing. This is the very uh, core point of our discussion. Uh, another fast example from Herculanum, as Sarah has mentioned before in the other uh, presentation, uh, it's uh, an archaeological site under a, a volcano in Italy, uh, large heritage, uh, an ancient Roman city surrounded by the modern town. And uh, I go forward with this, it's not important. We create some tools uh, in order to represent which are the, uh, what is the, uh, the landscape and the environment in which this uh, World Heritage Protein is uh, uh, inserted. In order to analyze this, so creating 3D model, urban 3D models uh, to create, to provide a base, uh, a common field of work for all the practitioners and uh, ortho images, very detailed tools, uh, and start with the very detailed mapping of each features of the site. In this case, uh, we have obviously, you can imagine this Roman site, so more than 8,000 surfaces, more than 2,000 rooms, a very uh, complicated site. But in, we have to consider that not only the attributes should be mapped, but uh, if you consider the documentation as a process, as we described in the uh, other slides, we have to map also our process in acquiring this data. So uh, identifying different issues, uh, et cetera. And this is very important. Also in this case, we use a geographic information system with all these components that you can read uh, later, uh, creating so different maps that can map, can enhance and evaluate all the attributes of the site. Uh, the water, the drainage system, uh, the clusters uh, connected to the problems connected, related to the water coming from the sky, uh, the density of some problems related to decay of the walls, uh, with numbers, obviously, big tables, uh, the um, uh, the, pri uh, the priorities related to the intervention to be done on the attributes and uh, based on values, mapping of archaeological values of the single rooms. This is very 
powerful tool in order to uh, balance your efforts uh, in uh, conservation intervention but also mapping people so how people move around the the, the site and uh, mapping behaviors of the people around the south these are all components uh, and should be considered attributes of the uh, certain values of the site so the topology of people that is moving this where are the stopping points the distribution all these uh, uh, behaviors in synthesis uh, we should consider the data collection uh, dealing with the data connection, we have to use, uh, in this case, I presented the geographic information system uh, tool uh, because it's a comprehensive one. This uh, management, this type, type of management, create obviously awareness on the real heritage attributes and real consistency of the attributes of your site and brings to the question which values are related to these attributes. Uh, Identifying the values is obviously uh, a matter of enhancing them, uh, protect them, share them, and manage, deal with it. And these all create uh, awareness on heritage values, not uh, that create at uh, this stage. Again, new needing for data collection, new needing for identification create enhancement, to create protection, to create sharing. So and also in this case, we have to deal with the circular process. Your task uh, will be, in this case, adding to the values and attributes exercise that we have seen before is an attribute mapping, very simple. Uh, I, I just want, I would like that you can um, the maps, uh, starting from the statement of the universal value of the uh, birthplace of Jesus uh, and the church, uh, uh, extracting the components that you can read in the statement, you have to add <coughs> to a maps uh, and uh, in the shared folder, you will fall, we will find uh, uh, some usable documentation to do this. And uh, I just want to come back to the values and attributes table. You can find uh, an ID column in order to um, give an ID to your attributes. And uh, so have the correspondence between the table and the, um, and the map that you are going to realize. Um, these are the maps that are available on the, uh, on the nomination uh, document that was, I downloaded from, uh, from, the, from, the web, from the website and put in the shared folder. And you will find different kinds of maps, very detailed one. So if the, the statement talks about the narthex of the church, for example, you can put and map the narthex, the position, the dimension, etc., giving it an ID, putting in a, in a, in a map. Um, I think this is all regarding this part. Okay. I'm sorry, I just mm, try to go very fast. So I hope uh, Thank everyone you can... Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was a lot of information, I have to say. It's quite dense and, you know... Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. And uh, we fully understand, but uh, also the, uh, the fact that we were running out of time. And um, my suggestion now, since it's already 15 minutes beyond the schedule, would be that if you have something to add for all the participants on the group exercise, I think we were discussing with Sarah of, about doing it next Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, during uh, the, the next session on Wednesday. But maybe what we can do is, I don't know if you want to do it orally now, or maybe we can share uh, some instructions about this group exercise, point participants to the documents they need to read so that they have time also to digest. We will share Yeah, maybe, maybe it's better this line. Yeah. Write it so yeah. that uh, from now till uh, next Tuesday, they will have, all, everybody will have enough time to, to absorb, to digest uh, all the information you shared uh, with us today, and also instructions on the exercise and the group work they will be doing next Wednesday, if you agree. So up to okay. you and Sarah to, to tell if this is okay. Yeah, I, I think it's the... The best way to do to deal with it because I, I know that it is a very um, huge amount of information 
and so uh, you need to digest. So we can we can uh, point out uh, the main uh, steps to follow during the exercise. I don't know, Sarah, if you agree. I think so, and uh, share with the participant, and they can manage to 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 do the exercise. Yeah, in, in the shared folder, I hope you now all have access. There is a there is a section for the group work, and there is already the document that explains things. So I think maybe it is best we will put our presentations from today as well, so you can review the material, look at it calmly, and then maybe start to look at the group uh, group work exercises. But we can continue this next Wednesday. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a good way forward. What I would suggest is also that maybe we can uh, really prepare an email, uh, a kind of wrap-up email, since we don't have time right now to, to, to do that, uh, in order for participants to be prepared and to know clearly what they are supposed to do from now till next week, so that we can start smoothly on Wednesday. And then maybe the 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 two of you plus us we can just debrief a little bit for the next uh, week in order to squeeze this in the program and maybe we can also share a revised version of the um, agenda for the for the next four days of this training if you agree huh? all right. It seems that we have an agreement, and uh, I think that with this one we can uh, say goodbye to all the participants. And uh, of course, the next session will be on Wednesday, uh, 9th of December next week at 10 o'clock. But in the meantime, you will receive this email uh, with this wrap up that we just discussed. And, uh, and also revised program for the upcoming sessions. If you have questions, keep them, of course. Feel free to write to us as well. Uh, and, uh, and we will be glad to, to respond next week as well. All right, great. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.